Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Crossing lines. Stop it. <laughs> I've been there, done that. <laughs> Everybody ready? Thanks, thanks, Tom. Pam, you ready? Mm -hmm. Call the meeting to order. Mr. Carter, you yes. have the privilege of the invitation. Join with me in prayer, please. Father God, as we as we undertake the business of Alamance County and its citizens. We're just cognizant, dear Lord, of the turmoil that goes around about us, a world in full, that's full of turmoil, dear Lord. We know you're in control. And we know you guide and direct each and every one of us that's willing to listen. We ask, Father God, for your wisdom, your courage to do the right thing, and, dear Lord, your presence with this group tonight. We ask you to guide us, keep us safe, Keep our citizens safe. Take us home safely from here tonight. Keep our citizens in Alamance County and in North Carolina and the United States and in the world, dear Lord. Keep us safe. We ask this, dear Father, in the powerful and holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we have the privilege. Master Chief Butler. Who's Master Chief Butler? Aha. Uh -huh. Would you and him? Awesome. <laughs> and Excellent. announce your name, please, sir. I am Graydon Perfetto. All right. And what is your position and rank? So, in the I am Cadet Lieutenant Commander at Western Alliance and RTC. Excellent. And I am the Executive Officer and also Field Team Commander. Very good. Excellent. We're proud of you. Absolutely. Would you lead us? Yes. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We thank you. Yes, sir. Don't leave, guys. You're <laughs> still on the agenda. Do we have a motion as to the approval of the agenda? Motion to approve. Second. Motion second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. We have, I believe, three speakers. Uh, John Comer. Thank you, Commissioners. My name is John Comer, and I reside here in Graham. Um, come here this evening to discuss a matter with you regarding an item that is on the agenda, that is the revised solid waste and recycle ordinances. Um, in addressing the committee with uh, all due respect, we uh, appreciate how these ordinances are written and, um, and how they've been passed. And we appreciate the efforts to keep the county uh, roads and highways safe as we considered in the former, in the previous meeting. We also have some concerns, myself and some of our neighbors, uh, with some of the hazardous and solid waste in particular that has been accumulating on some sites in the county, which is causing uh, disturbances, is causing uh, issues with vermin and rodents. Uh, it is also extremely unsightly. And we're here to express our concerns and to ask the committee to consider those concerns and uh, see if there is something that can be done about it. I own a piece of property on, on uh, Gray Fox Trail, 866 Gray Fox Trail. Uh, my wife and I wish to develop it into a mini farm, which we've already begun to do, and uh, uh, contribute to the agritourism uh, of Alamance County. <clears throat> However, uh, some of the residents on our road uh, and the summers with me, they're also residents on that road, can attest to these facts. Uh, they've allowed to accumulate uh, solid wastes 
in a matter in con a matter manner contrary to the ordinances as written. Uh, in fact, the one residence, 852 uh, Gray Fox Trail, have allowed uh, most of the items under the definitions, including commercial, solid waste, construction debris, demolition debris, trash, hazardous waste, industrial waste, inert debris, such as scrap metal, plastics, uh, uh, appliances, water heaters, tires, car batteries, and junk boats, and on, and on the list goes probably to the extent of somewhere between seven to 10 tons of debris on the property. There's another property there too, which is 815 Gray Fox Trail, where trash, um, clean out uh, garage and attic and uh, apartment clean out debris uh, has been allowed to accumulate to a similar degree perhaps not as large a volume, but extremely unsightly um, to the point that yard maintenance has become impossible there and the grass has not been cut this year that we know of. Uh, so mm. in addition to some other issues that we're experiencing down there that have been addressed with the planning department uh, and uh, environmental department of the county, um, including taking up residence in mobile homes without proper plumbing and uh, wastewater being discharged onto the uh, adjacent property and into a small creek that runs along the back of the property. So we wanted to um, address those issues with the commissioners tonight, uh, ask for your support, uh, and please give us any information that will help us to peacefully and legally resolve these issues. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Are you Gray Fox Trail, Burlington or Graham? Graham. Okay, thank you. Yes, and that's actually not my, my residence is here in town at 1123 Lorraine Street. Okay. And the mini farm is separate. Okay. But this, these properties are in the county, not the city. They are in the county. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Summers. I just, I'm with him. We were, right. I just had some pictures I was going to show you. All right, so you have three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we're dealing with. Yeah. Now, I like that, that one. <laughs> I do too. Let's go ahead and show you the other membership. Get yeah, a picture of a nice looking red car. That I, like. <laughs> uh, I don't know where my picture is at. Where's all your appliances? That's usually always a gather. Just email them to me. Yeah, you can email them to us. It's all good. This is what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And when he said a, a trailer, it was a camper that was right. pulled in. Um, I see it. That's the guy's truck. <laughs> okay, it looks familiar. Yeah. Thank you. And Tracy Lee. As you're approaching, there are some more seats here. If some of you folks, they're not a lot, but there are a few. You'll hang on just one minute. I'm pleased that the gentleman allowed the ladies to sit. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you can push it forward and give you some space. Absolutely. You can get it as much room as you need. <laughs> that is the best line of the night. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, Tracy Lee, 2121 Summers Avenue, Burlington. Feeling a little nervous, have to excuse me, and I have an overdue visit to the eye doctor. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, this is something that I become aware of in the last year uh, that concerns me. It's not on the agenda. A few years ago, Alamance County adopted a hiring policy prohibiting more than one family member, uh, more than one member of a family, from full-time employment within county departments. 
and he subsequently hired relatives are restricted to part-time employment status. North Carolina's right to work statute says in part, the right to live includes the right to work. The right to work shall not be denied or abridged on account of membership or non-membership in any labor union or organization. While this statute specifies unions, I feel like um, Alamance County's policy seems to fly in the face of the intent of such a statute. Uh, and it's penalizing fully qualified applicants based solely upon the circumstance of their birth or the coincidence of marriage. Um, while, not a no, while not discriminatory against any legally protected class, make no mistake, it is a discriminatory policy. There's a part-time employee whose position puts them in an increased risk, uh, increased exposure to certain health risks. This person, who's under 30 years old, recently experienced a medical emergency requiring multiple surgeries, a stint in the ICU, and a significant amount of time out of work necessary for the recovery required uh, to return the demands of their position. And bear in mind that this employee has regularly averaged full-time hours for the entirety of their employment and remains employed at a part-time status due to this policy. As a part-time employee, this medical emergency, possibly related to their repeated on-the-job exposure, has resulted in a severe loss of income. There's no sick pay, no vacation pay, nor an opportunity to apply for short-term disability uh, available to the county's part-time employees. Additionally, this employee and others like them receive no holiday pay, no enhanced insurance benefits, no 401k, no state retirement, no annual performance review with the opportunity for an annual raise, all because of the circumstance of their birth or the coincidence of marriage. And in this particular case, uh, the hours missed due to illness and recovery will very likely prevent this particular employee from qualifying from even the basic level health care with the county next year. If the day should come that we need emergency services, we all hope to be served by individuals with the dedication necessary to potentially put their lives on the line with each and every call. Um, 24 hour, well, working 12 to 24 hour shifts, 365 days a year. Suffice to say, the pool of skilled applicants is already a comparatively small one, and often qualified applicants for this line of work are the embodiment of service to country, the long revered American value that can often be found coursing through the veins of so many American generations of American families. The county's hiring <laughs> prohibition potentially even further reduces the pool of applicants for these full time positions while quite literally, quite literally driving qualified Alamance County citizens with a desire to serve their community to surrounding counties and municipalities for full time employment. Aside from typical and expected policies regarding nepotism, no nearby county or municipality appears to institute a similarly prohibited hiring policy. Even as I speak, there are full-time emergency services positions in Alamance County that remain unfilled while qualified individuals are deemed ineligible, depriving Alamance County residents of the benefit of that service and skill. And I apologize. Yeah. If I don't keep everybody I'm allowed you to go beyond the three minutes. Oh, okay, but, okay I'm sorry. Uh, you just need to kind of bring it to an end. Okay, the end is others whose signatures I present and I um, urge the commission to halt this policy, reverse this policy, and make amends to the um, affected employees. May I request that you give the signatures, the materials to our county manager, and uh, we can have our legal staff look into the matter. Thank you. Thank you. My print was not working, so this is my working copy. I'm sorry, I don't have a pretty copy. I can give you right. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll apologize to everyone in advance. We have these time limits for your protection, and hopefully, so we can go to supper at some point before midnight. <laughs> Thank you. I apologize. Uh, okay, we have a consent agenda. Motion to approve. Someone. Uh, we have a motion and second. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Now the good part of the job. We have the, uh, well, Master Chief Butler again, uh, would you and your folks come forward? And 
Tammy Crawford, would you also come forward, please? Is Miss Crawford here? She was. Is she in the overflow? She might be in the overflow. Let's hold on just a second so we can bring her in. Guys, push that thing up so you yeah, guys can all stand all in give line you as together. Much space as you need. You got there you go. Good job. Being military, we knew you could handle that. <laughs> Uh, by the way, um, at the Alco Alamance County Balloon Festival, we use the Civil Air Patrol extensively for crew and so forth. Uh, extraordinary job that they perform for the entire weekend. Uh, I know that's not who you guys are, but you're a first cousin. <laughs> okay. Um, Ms. Crawford, yeah. can you kind of... Squeeze between. <laughs> Good evening. So we're here this evening to talk about Operation Greenlight. And so what we're doing, we're allowing one or more of you guys to read the proclamation, but she's going to make the presentation. So guys, you have to have to wait. <laughs> Please, ma'am. All right. Each year we come together as a nation on Veterans Day to honor and celebrate the hundreds of thousands of brave Americans who have served our country in uniform. Now more than ever, our veterans need support in a time when our country is divided in so many issues. We can all agree that those individuals who risk everything to protect our country and our way of life deserve our support and gratitude. <coughs> That's why this year, Alamance County is joining our colleagues across the nation in launching Operation Greenlight for Veterans. This is an initiative designed to shine a bright a light on the service of our veterans and their families. And so just to say a little bit, the National Association of Counties and the National Association of County Veteran Service Officers collaborated to make this Operation Greenlight come through all across the country, and I'm really proud that we're doing it here. With the pursuit pursuit of the safety and security of our nation comes the responsibility to support and serve the veterans who sacrificed on our behalf. Unfortunately, too many recent veterans after nearly two decades of constant war are struggling to transition back to civilian life. Veteran suicides have claimed over 30,000 lives since 2001, four times more than the number of U.S. military personnel who died in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. While the vast majority of veterans return healthy and prepared for civilian life, we must be better as a nation. As part of Operation Greenlight for Veterans, Alamance County is illuminating our historic courthouse, Green, beginning November 7th. And we encourage individuals and businesses to join us by changing one light bulb in the entryway of your house or business to a green bulb. By shining a green light, we let veterans know they are seen, appreciated, and supported. While this event is focused on the week of Veterans Day, November 7th through 13th, we encourage individuals to continue to shine the light all year through. Operation Green Light is also an opportunity to raise awareness of resources available to veterans and their families. Here in Alamance County, we're proud to serve 7,594 veterans through our Alamance County Veterans Service. Throughout the year, our county staff are busy connecting our veterans to federal and state benefits, helping them manage employment needs and doctor's appointments, as well as helping them find veteran peers who can assist with the transition back to civilian life. Veterans and family members can learn more about available services, services at Alamance County Veterans Service Office. The Veterans Day on Veterans Day, join us in shining a light of hope and support. Join Operation Greenlight, and let's turn Alamance County green for our veterans. If anyone needs information, the county will have it out on their website. Um, we have a county Facebook page and Twitter account. Also, any information you need regarding Operation Greenlight is in my office, so feel free to contact me. But I hope that our whole county is lit up green during this, <laughs> this week. Thank Who you. among you has the highest rank? Would you like to read the proclamation? 
Okay. Well, you deflected that pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and we thank you. State your name, please, sir. I'm Cadet Lieutenant Commander Versace. Yeah. <coughs> Same gentleman that led us earlier. Um, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. um, whereas the residents of Alamance County have great respect, admiration, and the utmost gratitude for all of the men and women who have selflessly served our country and this community in the armed forces, and whereas the contributions and sacrifices of the men and women who served in the armed forces have been vital in maintaining the freedoms and way of life enjoyed by our citizens, and whereas Alamance County seeks to honor these individuals who have paid the high price for freedom by placing themselves in harm's way for the good of all. And whereas there are approximately 689,259 veterans in the state of North Carolina, with over 9,000 of them res residing in Alamance County, and whereas veterans continue to serve their community in the American Legion, veterans of foreign wars, religious groups, civil service, and whereas approximately 200,000 service members transition to civilian communities annually, and whereas an estimated 20% increase of service members will transition to ci civilian life in the near future, and whereas studies indicate that 44% to 72% of, of service members experience high levels of stress during the transition from military to civilian life. And whereas active military service members transitioning from military service are at a high risk for suicide during the first year after military service. And whereas Alamance Qu County Board of Commissioners appreciates and sacrifices of our United States military personnel and believes specific recognition should be granted. And now therefore it be it resolved with designation as a green light for Military Service County, Alamance County, hereby declares from November 7, 2022 through November 13, 2022, a time to salute and honor the services and sacrifices of our men and women in uniform transitioning from active service. And be it further resolved that in observance of Operation Greenlight, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners encourages its citizens and patriotic tradition to recognize the importance of honoring all those who made immeasurable sacrifices to preserve freedom by displaying a green light in the window of their place of business or residence. Thank you, sir. Military, would you like to make the motion that we pass this proclamation? <laughs> I, I move that we pass the proclamation. Thank you. And I suck at that motion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 We appreciate all of you guys. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything you guys do. And you can hang on to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we expect that to be framed in somewhere in a place of prominence in the near future. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I wonder if I, if I might uh, just take a few minutes and just ask Lieutenant uh, Blackwood a couple of questions about the Absolutely. program. Absolutely. Uh, state, have... state your former position in the military and what branch of the military. Oh, well, I, I was a former naval officer, and, I, and actually we spent some time in Virginia Beach together at the Oceana Naval Air Station. Um, we just met tonight, though. Uh, there may be some people out there who, who don't know about the JR and ROTC program, or the JR, JROTC program at, uh, at Western Alamance High School. Could you just tell the citizens of generally what the mission of the organization yes, is? Absolutely. So Western Alamance uh, and JROTC is a citizenship program. So we're just making, uh, or attempting to make <laughs> them better leaders, uh, more responsible and accountability for actions. So um, the big misnomer that people, a lot of people think that in RTC we're trying to get them to join the military, and that's not the case. If that's their goal, that's their ambition, uh, absolutely. We, we support them, but if they want to go to college, they want to go to trade school, whatever, we're just trying to make, like I say, better leaders who are accountable and responsible for their actions. And I tell all my cadets that there's no job that you can walk in and tell them that you have those attributes that it isn't going to help. So that's what we strive to do, and uh, it works out. Do you have to live in the Western Elements District to be a member of the So you do not necessarily need to live in the West Alabama District. Uh, you can still take our class, but uh, you just, student just has to have some kind of um, transportation to in there because we can't drive transportation. But um, if they're old enough to drive and they can take it like the end block, things like that, we allow it. But obviously, as we within reason, if they have to travel like over 30, 40 minutes, it's not productive to us or them to get there uh, that late in class. But uh, in the nearby schools, around 15, 20 minutes, uh, there's no issues. We have uh, students from Williams uh, last semester, and uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Have a question. So you and Craig were at the same base. <laughs> yeah. Call me. <laughs> 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 
We thank you. There's thank pictures. you very much. You know there's pictures. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. We appreciate you and so what you're doing. Next thing on our agenda is a resolution in support of the Always Stop Installation Highway 49 and Friendship Patterson Mill Road. Um, and initially that was going to be presented by Senator Gailey and by our uh, House Representative Rodell. Uh, they are in a meeting and unable to be here uh, due to that conflict. Uh, and so, uh, Ms. Oakley, are you going to present that or, or should I? Mr. Stevens is going to present that. Yes. Right. Thank you. In the absence of the Senator, I will read the resolution. Uh, resolution requesting the assistance of the Alamance County Delegation of the North Carolina General Assembly, whereas the intersection of Highway 49 South and State Road 1130, also known as Friendship Patterson Mill Road, has had numerous accidents in the past few years, some very serious, and whereas a very large manufacturing plant will be opened in the near future, substantially increasing the traffic on these roads even more, and whereas the North Carolina Department of Transportation's Traffic Engineering Division has investigated this intersection and concluded an all-way stop needs to be installed at this location. And whereas the North Carolina Department of Transportation has agreed to expedite installation of an all-way stop in this intersection due to grave safety concerns and has estimated the work will cost approximately $25,000. And whereas Alamance County has been advised funding is available from the state of North Carolina for the installation of an all-way stop at the above mentioned intersection. Now, be it therefore resolved, the Alamance County Board of County Commissioners, for the reasons given, hereby respectfully request the delegation representing Alamance County in the North Carolina General Assembly pursue funding to ensure the North Carolina Department of Transportation can install an always stop at the intersection of Highway 49 South and on State Road 1130, Friendship Patterson Mill Road, to protect all drivers traveling through the area. This is the 17th day of October, 2022. Thank you. Motion to approve. I'll second. Any other discussion? I've been through here many, many times, and mm -hmm. that is a dangerous intersection. Uh, see the sheriff shaking his head in a positive fashion. Uh, any other discussion? Just down there today. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Show that it's unanimous. Thank you. And by the way, Senator Gailey and Representative Rydell spent a lot of time working on this, getting us to a position to do this tonight. We're making the recommendation, and hopefully DOT will take care of the problem in the very near future. Okay, third item. Um, Ms. Sullivan. Sure. <laughs> I want to be this close. <laughs> We're not that bad. <laughs> Thank you. All right, good evening, commissioners. I'm Sky Sullivan, the director of the Family Justice Center. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask some of our partners to join me here at the front. I know it'll be a little crowded, but you know who you are. Come on. Come on. Come on. If you work in the FJC, come on. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we have representatives here, not from all of our partner agencies on site. Um, however, this Domestic Violence Awareness Month, we'd like to highlight these partnerships. Without them, we would not be able to serve the victims of domestic violence, elder abuse, human trafficking, sexual assault, and child abuse that we're able to serve at the Family Justice Center. So in our building, we have the Alamance County Sheriff's Office Special Victims Unit, Burlington Police Department Special Victims Unit, Department of Social Services, both Economic Services and a Child Protective Services Unit, our Elder Justice Project, EnviroSafe, High Lethality Safety Planning, Elon Law Legal Services, Family Abuse Services of Alamance County, Legal Aid of North Carolina, the Family Justice Center as the department, uh, RHA Health Services and Women's Resource Center. Also want to highlight the Justice Advisory Council who provides us um, as as kind of our governing body and our uh, 
advisory in nature to the work that we do. Um, also, not located in the building, but they do pop on a screen twice a day for electronic hearings of restraining orders, our clerk's office, and our judges as well. So I'm going to introduce Deetra Betts from Family Abuse Services. She is their executive director who is going to read this proclamation. <laughs> <laughs> and while she's getting them, purple is our color, which is why you see the, the bright purple tonight. I know Bill got the message. Good evening. Thank you Good for evening. having the opportunity to present this evening. So Alamance County Board of Commissioners Proclamation Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Whereas domestic violence is the willful intimidation, physical assault, battery, sexual assault, and or other abusive behavior as part of a systematic pattern of power and control perpetrated by one intimate partner against another. And whereas in the United States, one in four women and one in 10 men experience sexual violence, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner during their lifetime. And whereas domestic violence does not discriminate, it's prevalent in every community, people of any race, age, gender, sexuality, religion, education level, nationality, or economic status can be a victim. And whereas in response to multiple murder suicides and a community issue of domestic violence, Family Abuse Services of Alamance County was formed in 1985 to serve victims and their children with vital safety services. And whereas only a coordinated community effort will put a stop to this heinous crime. The Family Justice Center of Alamance County opened its doors in 2010 and provides one-stop services for victims of family violence and elder abuse. Under one roof, professionals from different disciplines, including law enforcement, social services, victim services, nonprofits, and other government organizations work together to provide consolidated and coordinated safety, legal, and social aid to victims, I mean to individuals and families in need. And whereas the Family Justice Center and its partners have served over 1,200 victims over 1,700 times so far in 2022. And whereas there have been 28 domestic violence homicides in North Carolina so far in 2022. And whereas Domestic Violence Awareness Month provides an excellent opportunity for citizens to learn more about preventing violence and to show support for the numerous organizations and individuals who provide critical advocacy and assistance to victims. And whereas Alamance County has a moral obligation to work to prevent domestic violence, address its brutal and destructive eff effects, and make ending domestic violence a local priority. And now, therefore, it is be it resolved, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners hereby proclaims October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Alamance County and urges all citizens to actively support the work being done toward the elimination of domestic violence. Adopted this, the 17th day of October, 2022. Signed John Paisley, Jr., Chairman, Alamance County Board of Commissioners. And we need a motion. Ms. Thompson, I think you're the, on the social service. What would you like to make that motion? I would absolutely like to make a motion to support you guys in every way possible. Thank you. Have a second? I'll second. second. Oh, Mr. Carter, second. second. Any discussion? No, but why don't the two officers at the end tell you what they get to do? <laughs> if I come in and I need a 50B and I do it by via electronic to the judge and he grants it what do you do oh well if it's a violation we first when the 50b comes out we serve it uh we seize firearms uh at that time uh evict the person from the residence uh go over the 50b to the defendant as well as the <coughs> plaintiff uh tells the plaintiff that she has access to us she can call anytime in reference to any questions or anything 
or if it's something else that Family Abuse Services or FJC can do, we refer them back to there. Like if it's change the locks, uh, alarms, or security cameras, stuff like that. Uh, if it proceeds to a criminal violation, then it comes back to special victims, and we investigate it to press charges or you know go forth and arrest the person. And that's a really dangerous call for a law enforcement officer, isn't it? Oh yes, ma'am. The most dangerous. I appreciate what you guys do. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other? We haven't voted yet. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, read it again. Read it again. <laughs> uh, any other comments? I would like to say I think all of us, all five commissioners, have been to your facility, Family Justice uh, Facility over on Martin Street. You guys do a super job, and all of us would like to say thank you. And I'd like to say all in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 One other question. Is unanimous. Are, are you guys back in the school system with the puppets yet? Not yet. Is that coming uh, up in director, February? Our director of development has reached out to the school system, and they're facilitating the visit, so it will be up and going. Okay. Pretty Scott, soon. do you want to introduce everybody? Sure. <laughs> Um, so I just introduced Dietra Betts. This is LaTanya Faust, Director of Underserved, underserved Programs, programs um, at Family Abuse Services, and Ashley Corbett, the Director of Finance for Family Abuse Services. We have Attorney Margaret Dudley. She is the Supervising Attorney for the Elon Law Legal Services Program. Mm -hmm. Susan Watson is the Executive Director of Women's Resource Center. I keep having to turn and see who's <laughs> behind me. Uh, Candace Goble, who is our Director of Social Services. Um, Corporal Nash and Sergeant Tom Mowbray and then we do have a detective who hid from us sitting back there as well <laughs> she's on day two three something like that um, and then Cliff and the sheriff decided not to stand with us as well but there are our partners. <laughs> we thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you thank you very much Is that copy signed? I think I previously signed it. I'm sure. Okay, Dr. Thorpe. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Oh, what a wonderful day. <laughs> Every day's a holiday. Every day's a dream. <laughs> Every day's a dream. Slices of rain for you know, pretty metal, right? That's it. <laughs> okay, so. I do acknowledge that we have the superintendent and at least two, I see. Are there only two board members here? We thank you for being here. Okay, I think the common theme today has been glasses, so <laughs> uh, some of you that uh, don't have to use them yet. <laughs> I'm glad uh, some of us do. Okay, so let's see. We're starting off, and I have to take a moment off. The project, uh, projected project cost increases. Um, as you're all very aware, uh, you've seen it numerous times now with the different projects going on. You've seen it with your own project. Projects uh, hitting the funding numbers right now are, is a gamble. It's a moving target. Um, I just noticed that the asphalt index is going up again, which means uh, the cost of any petroleum products will be going up, the cost of your PVCs, the cost of your asphalt, the cost of everything. Uh, it'll hit some of your paints, it'll hit multiple sessions. So uh, the key uh, right now is kind of like what our bond projects, and I've got really good news from the bond projects when we get to those, but uh, is to try to lock stuff in, get under contract, and to have a firm hold. So let me go through the projects that the board has approved, and I'll give you kind of updates of where we stand, what's going on. Uh, I did notice one project, though it's not on here, and it's the uh, middle school camera project. Uh, it was a half million dollars uh, is what we estimated at the time. Right now, our designers are continuing to work through that project. Uh, so that one's not on the list, but that is one that is in progress. Uh, we still feel very comfortable right now at that number just because of uh, being able to lock a few things in a little early. So, uh, we which, do have... Which middle school? Sir? Which middle school? It's for our middle schools that don't have cameras. Right now, the only two middle schools that have full cameras or a full camera system is Turntine. Uh, Broadview has a partial. 
So we are, and Graham Middle School has a full. So that 500,000 was to bring our other middle schools and to replace the ones in Broadview and bring in a full system there. So what we've uh, kind of, what we hit, and um, well, I really don't know how to lead into this, but we're just gonna jump into it, how about that? Uh, had a wonderful like a meeting. <laughs> had a wonderful lengthy meeting with DOT on Friday. So there's a couple things that's going on that our projects, um, that DOT plays a major role in our projects. So we did find out for 100% sure that the true road, road improvements that we did at Southern and at the new high school, Southeast, are 100% reimbursable. The, what was done on the highway. Okay, there's more work done on the highway, okay? Uh, there's a 50, there's, we have the opportunity to also ask for $50,000 back for reimbursement for the two bus lots that went into those two sites because that is part of North Carolina DOT's responsibility up to $50,000. Now, their numbers, and they admitted it, um, are kind of like ours, they're outdated. So for what they call spot mobility, is where we have to do improvements on our property, there is a cap at $750,000. Now, two years ago when that cap was set, $750,000 would have done a whole lot of work. Uh, but in today's market, $750,000 does about a third of that work. So, uh, but we are in line, we are doing the paperwork, we are providing DOT with the information. The rules behind some of this, and like I said, we learned a lot of this on Friday, uh, had a really in-depth conversation. We have to have it submitted by December. In March, it goes before their committee. If they select to fund the spot mobility, the $750,000, uh, we will be reimbursed. So it's left up to the DOT committee of which projects they accept. The um, road improvement projects, is um, with a new high school, we cannot do a full submission, a final submission, until it is occupied. Um, they did that, they, their explanation for that is like if it was a private school that just decided they didn't want to open it as a private school, they didn't want funds invested. So that one's there. Uh, Southern Middle School, Southern High School, Southern Middle School improvements, uh, we've had two small easements we're dealing with right now with the general public and it's going really well. Uh, once that's finalized and we can put down the final striping and do some improvement on the shoulder of the road, that one is eligible for reimbursement. So we'll be submitting that one between now and the first of the year. So, and that's leading us into kind of some of our other projects that's on this list. So uh, the AO traffic pattern, you know, as I said, the, stuff, the prices have doubled. Uh, we were projected at 316. Uh, you're looking at a proposed project number of almost $800,000 now, 790000 I don't think the market's going to change enough to bring those numbers down drastically over the next few years. Uh, but that, that relates right back to what uh, I was saying with the asphalt index, uh, just that number potentially climbs. Uh, Grand Middle School roofing, uh, we're looking at close, close to 1.3 million. Uh, Graham High School roofing, and I'm gonna throw Southern, um, and this as well, uh, you're looking at almost $5 million. One thing we have done, because now with TPO, insulation, and everything at such high prices, uh, we did have metal priced for the single buildings. And for, and it's, it's included in the five million, but for about $300,000 per site, we can put metal on about two thirds of the building. By putting metal, that's a 50 year, 40 to 50 year fix. It's something I'll, I'll never have to worry about and many other folks will not as well. Uh, so, you know, I would say it's worth the 300,000 per site to do that. Um, so the Howell River roofing project, again, it hit a, a pretty big uh, or significant increase at 1.9. The How River Masonry, again, masonry's not going up as much. What's hurting us on some of these other trades is the labor. 
Uh, labor prices are going up every day. Uh, to keep good folks, these people, these people, they have to pay uh, good money, much better than $15 an hour. So that's hitting us in some of our projects. Uh, EM Holt traffic, almost three times. We did have a conversation with DOT about shortening some of the asphalt, using some existing asphalt on the site so we would not have to go as much. Uh, they are to let us know, and at that point we'll make some adjustments there if they'll allow it. Uh, and, you know, EM Holt is one of the intersections that uh, we all hear a lot about. Uh, it's coming off that hard curve there, uh, so we have a lot of potential there for accidents. Is shortening that going to keep that potential for accidents available? Well, what we were wanting to shorten the asphalt, but not shorten the length. Use okay. some of the asphalt on site and tie into it. Okay. And also to keep an existing parking lot, instead of trying to make a whole new parking lot, keep an existing parking lot and just put down an asphalt path for cars. So just some minor changes, uh, and they seemed real receptive to talking about those. Can I back up and ask you one thing? Yes, ma'am. You were talking about metal roofs at, um, was it Grand Metal? Where were Grand you? High. Grand, Grand High, High and Southern High. Are, is your, okay, Todd, I'm a girl. Is the whole roof gonna be metal, or are you gonna have metal the other okay you'll have a combination because you got some buildings that are too large and they weren't designed to put a metal roof on so the smaller buildings where we have eight classrooms it will look very similar to Eastlawn's roof it's a very low pitch roof so you really don't notice it it's not like Smith where it's got the real high peaks it's a very low pitch roof it's um, it's not going to look like you run out of metal. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Okay. No, ma'am. You won't see a building won't transition unless there's a transition wall for it to transition okay. to. Okay, I'm good. Okay. It's a girl thing. I know. Please stop me. I'm, I hope I'm not up here presenting. I hope I'm up here, you know, having a conversation. Uh, okay, Southeast High School, you, we talked about the road improvements, the 523000 uh, the other 1.2 is the vocational building, which is going up very quickly. Uh, Southern High improvements we've talked about. Southern High roofing. There's I, the middle school cameras are on here. I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Um, so that one, like I said, is in design, but we feel very comfortable there. AW traffic. Again, that's that's one of the intersections that we're stopping traffic on 119 and 54. Uh, for about 15, 20 minutes in the morning and probably about 45 minutes in the afternoon. And with the new high school opening on 119 and the Honda plant on 119, uh, this one is carrying a little more priority for us to try to go ahead and make this happen. Uh, the Woodlawn Roofing Project, we're still waiting on materials. That's, that's become a problem in the roofing world. Uh, we, were, we were to have materials set on site in August, then it turned September, now it's October. Uh, it's it's not available so any of the projects that uh, require a roof we are having the where it used to be a year out we're going to, have to start looking two and three years out uh, until the material until the materials become available it's just it's a tough world and the the complaint or the concern about materials and we addressed it uh, at one time if you used a certain TPO or PVC they required a certain insulation or they wouldn't warrant it. Uh, so we have now inquired and they have they've signed agreements that you know, now they will accept one, two, or three different forms of insulation and still warrant to their work. Uh, that was those partnerships. Y'all know how that works. <laughs> it was those partnerships, but they were losing work trying to get there. So um, I'll be honest with you, Woodlawn, we will not see another roof at $30 a square foot, $28 a square foot. Everything we see from this point forward will be 40 to $50 a square foot. That's, we're just in that really strange market. They don't have water pulling out of the ceiling like Broadview and Cummins did. Woodlawn does, have. yes ma'am. Woodlawn, there's trash cans sitting everywhere. Uh, what I'm concerned about, because I've got some more on here and I'm not pushing other topics, I just threw those up there. Uh, you got Western Middle, you got some others that's starting to to deteriorate pretty quickly. Uh, we need to get some of these under our belt, get them out to bid, get them locked in, and then move on to discussing how we can possibly fund some of these others. And we may have some possibilities, and 
definitely up to conversation with our board, your board, our TRC meetings, and our oversight meetings about those different funding sources, and can we tap into something else available. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, not good news, um, but again, this is the market we're in. I'm just very thankful that our bond projects, we got them at the numbers we got them on that. And like I said, I'll go over those numbers kind of as we go through each one. Uh, there's there's some good news there, and there's going to be some more good news, I think, coming out of those as long as we can hold tight to our, to our numbers that we have now. So... We do want to ask for the eight million, but let's let's go through let's go through some stuff, and then can we come back to this, Mr. Chairman? Are you okay coming back to this? Okay, okay. I feel like it's important to kind of get the whole picture, and then we'll come back to it. Is okay. Baker Roof doing any of the projects? Baker's not done any roof since Broadview Cummins for us. I know they um, did a really good job. I didn't they, know do. they, had good they do. They uh, do. I think they're like a lot of the others. They're having to be selective because mm -hmm. of just the amount of work that's out there and their labor forces are getting smaller and smaller every day. Uh, we, we're experiencing that in our maintenance department. Uh, you know, as we lose positions, it's taking a lot of time to hire someone back to do yeah, a trace position. come back to, do you mean tonight or do you mean? I, I would like to discuss the eight million difference that we talked about here, no, but I'd like to go through this if you're okay with that and we just roll right back no, into this document. That. Okay. I heard today on Fox News that for every person unemployed, there are two jobs available in this country. Mm -hmm. So why aren't they there? Go ahead. Okay, so our capacity. I was asked just to address a little bit with our capacity. Um, you got enrollment this year. We're at about 22, 321 when we took the snapshot. Our capacity for the district is 24,635 the way we currently sit. Now, something about capacity that you need to be aware of, capacity in the school can change based upon the programs in the school. Uh, so if you take a, an exceptional children's program that only allows 12 students, and the capacity has been calculated at 24, so that's 12 students no longer counted in your capacity. Uh, this, the capacities that you're seeing here are the true capacities that an architect has assigned to our brick and mortar buildings. <coughs> the good news is with our, like Eastern Alamance, Southern, or excuse me, Eastern Alamance, uh, Western, if I put my glasses on I can see, right? Western Alamance High and Eastern Western goes to 1250. Your South Melbourne goes to 800. So we do have some increases. Southern goes to 1500. And you know, Southeast is at 1250 with a 1500 capacity. So our high school capacities are getting better. Uh, we're to the point that we will have some room for growth there. Some of the issues you see with our elementary schools as well, and as you can see as you drive through campus, we have multiple mobile units sitting. Uh, they are living, their, they've outlived their lifespan. Uh, there's at some point and a good conversation again for our boards and our committees is to start discussing possible funding sources uh, to put these schools into brick and mortar because where there's mobile setting at that's where we're having growth uh, to go ahead and to do brick and mortar one it's, it's a lot more efficient too it's a lot safer yeah. uh, it does also help the appearance of your campuses as folks move into our areas uh, it just looks bad but that's a conversation for us to start uh, sooner than later. Uh, more than willing to talk about what different funding sources may be available or what pots of money or what we can do together or jointly to try to figure out how we're going to accomplish that. <coughs> we are to a point that um, we did some redistricting Monday night, Tuesday. Tuesday. Look at my board chair and I'm like, what day was it? <laughs> She don't know either, so we're all Tuesday good. Afternoon. It was Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon. Uh, we did some redistricting within our elementary schools that uh, may help us even out some of the schools that are overcrowded, as well as provide capacity at Graham, Cummins, and Williams since they have special, or Williams has a couple specialty programs, Graham has a couple, and we're anticipating starting some specialty <laughs> programs at the at Cummins as well. 
uh, to be able to give them some additional room so these programs can begin and hopefully develop quickly and become very successful. So your, your capacity numbers, I'll be more than happy to update you anytime you ask. Uh, if you want to ever want a copy of anything, just send me an email or I'll come back here and discuss it with you. The sheet that you gave us does not have the new Southeast High School on it, does it? Right. Right, right. It's a 1250. Oh, 1250. 1250, yes. It has a 1500 core. We went ahead and did the larger core, which is your cafeteria space and everything else, because that's the cheapest space you can build. So we went ahead and did the core. Uh, it will also be designed very much like Elon was designed. That the wings of the academic halls can be expanded to grow as we grow. And they can even actually grow over 1,500. It's just you have to change your core capacity at that point. I just had that very conversation with a citizen this afternoon. Uh, there's, I've had a lot of conversations. There are a lot of people interested, interested in our growth, interested in our growth patterns. And, you know, one thing, if you really look closely at our growth and at the patterns, uh, it's, it's sporadic in some ways. But other ways, if you look right down to the corridor of 85, uh, that's where a lot of your uh, apartments are going in at. And still the Mevin area is growing. I think we'll start seeing more and more growth in the southern part of the county very soon, especially <coughs> with the industry that's going in down there and people seeking mm -hmm. work. So. <coughs> Any questions uh, about our capacity? Anything I can answer or give you some more information? Board, any questions? I think we just covered the one about Southeast. Mm -hmm. one, so. Okay, so this is kind of a, a, a opportunity for us to brag a little bit and to give you some good information. And, and share some information with you that it's been said. Uh, it's been said several different times, different ways, but just to give you some numbers. So, of course, I clicked off, right? There we go. Okay, Southern High School. Southern's our first uh, school on the list. Before I talk actually about the slide, uh, some, you know, I'm getting a lot of questions about completion. When is these schools going to be completed? So, contractually, we have a su substantial completion coming up very quickly, 1031. Uh, that means that uh, we should be getting COs and being able to get into the buildings. Uh, we have a final completion of 1229. So, that gives the opportunity to pick up anything that was not covered the first time, as well as... Um, be able to take care of the punch sheets, punch list. Uh, they, they take a while sometimes. Uh, I'll be very you know, honest about Southern. I'm not seeing a long punch sheet. They've done a very good job about taking care of stuff as it's gone instead of letting it get to be a lengthy sheet. <coughs> so Southern, it is definitely ahead of schedule. You know, it's a $20,661,931,000 uh, bond budget. Our construction was 17.1. That was the cement risk. And that also includes the highway improvements in that 17.1. And we had about a 3.5 million um, owner expenses, which covers your design, covers your testing, covers you know, all the stuff, the furniture, the equipment. So <coughs> that one is on budget and, like I said, on time. So just to give you a little bit of a a preview if you've not had the chance and uh, Mr. Chairman our, my offer is still open if we ever want to do a field trip I'm more than happy uh, we may be doing some ribbon cutting soon so we may be able to take care of a lot of them at one time uh, so if it's southern if you look to the left that's what the awnings looked like before that's much better look to the right you have about you know three more foot of sidewalk you don't have the pole in the center and we did do a little over $100,000, almost $200,000 of drainage at that particular school. So it's, uh, it still has some issues. Uh, but I don't think you'll ever work the issues out of an old building, but the drainage has definitely helped. So here's your new building. Uh, the classroom on the bottom right, which now has come a long way since this picture was made. 
Uh, there's a staff restroom top right. Uh, on your left, you see a workroom top. On the bottom, you see the new science labs that we put in. Here's the front of the entrance. Uh, so you see your, your lobby to your right, the picture in the center. That's behind that wall, and I couldn't get behind the wall because they were doing work that day. That's your safety vestibule. To your left is another extension of your safety vestibule that's put in. Uh, there's your awnings again. Uh, Looks a whole lot better, a lot cleaner. Uh, the student, if you are there now, the student movement's a whole lot easier. Uh, easier to manage, easier to observe. So here's your house. This is the same house. <laughs> to your left, that's what it looked like before we started. I love that floor. To the right, uh, that's what our students are traveling on now. Wow. That was a cattle shoot before when they were trying it, to it was. <laughs> it was. It was tight and moved fast. Uh, so here's your cafeteria. The, you see in the center, that's your new front to your cafeteria. It doesn't have the two old metal doors that uh, look really bad going in. Uh, you get to see different pictures. The picture on the top left is the new addition, so it's got a little arch to it. It looks a little different. The garage doors you see are fire doors. They're required as part of the uh, fire code. So they do have the fire doors. They, don't, they come down uh, if a heat sensor or a smoke sensor comes off, but you know, when we do fire alarms and stuff, they're, they'll be fine. They, they will not come down. Uh, here's your restrooms. If you notice, um, very clean. Uh, either white block with a tile backsplash around sinks. Where we did some of the older restrooms, these are the newer ones, where we did some of the older restrooms, the walls were in such bad shape we had to tile the whole wall. Uh, that's just a, more of an expense and also a little more difficult cleaning. Uh, but in the new restrooms, we was able to put the water splash behind the sinks, behind the toilets. Okay, so Williams. <laughs> wow. All right, so Williams' substantial completion date was 9 26 22, uh, which we've met. We, we well met that one. Uh, as you know, we had their uh, welcome back ceremonies in there. So uh, their. Final completion, 11:25. So they're in the punch sheet list right now and taking care of the, the stuff that needs to be taken care of. We had a bond budget of $4,646,400. Uh, the contract, contract budget was $4,065,874. Our contingency, our expense uh, was $585,26 on that particular project. So I'll end, uh, even from the contract date to the day, we're under budget $284,782. And that is not with, we have not done our final closeout. Uh, don't, there's, not any, there's really not any money left in the kitty, but when we do the final closeout, what we look for is a, any way, any opportunity for us to get a positive change order to add to that number, whether it's a dollar or whether it's a hundred dollars or what. But these numbers, they're going to fluctuate just a little bit, but I don't see them going down. If anything, we were hopeful and wishful they'll go up. Did you mention what the number was for something? The, the bond budget or the actual contract? The, how much we anticipate being on the budget? We're, we're dead on budget. Dead on. That's the CM at risk. Yep. So it's bid it out to the exact dollar. Okay. Okay. Uh, now there are contingency in there that may come back to us at the end. Um, that's what we're working on now too, as far as making sure those closeout documents reflect anything that's there. But we, like I said, we had to upgrade the um, drainage and stuff there some, so we had to use some of our contingency just to make sure that was that was appropriate. So Williams High School, there's to your left is one of your old seats. To the right is one of your new ones. Uh, the one to the right, uh, it is a very sturdy seat. It's actually used in a lot of outdoor arenas. Uh, more and more school systems are putting them in their auditoriums because one, the parts are available. They've been available, they will be available. It's a standard. Also the cushions, where if you have one of the heavy cushion seats, if somebody cuts it, tears it, messes it up, you know, it can be a couple hundred dollars. 
Uh, the bottom cushion, the last week price was $25. The top cushion was $23. It pops out by using the same tool as you use to take upholstery out of a car, and it pops right back in. So it will be easily uh, maintained in the future. As well, it is hard surface. So, and I think COVID taught us a lot uh, during that time period, whether whether COVID, the flu, or whatever else, we need surfaces that we can clean, surfaces that we can misc, mist. Uh, so here's another picture. So to the left, the old auditorium. To the right, your new bleachers, fresh coat of paint, um, new flooring, new carpet. The old uh, concrete that was under the seats had never really been stained. Uh, so we was able to get it stained. It looks really nice. If you've not had an opportunity, that's a, a really nice place to go visit. Again, just some additional pictures. You can see in the carpet going down to the stage. I got accused of picking that because it's black and gold. And if it's App's <laughs> color, I said, no, if it's William's color. So. <laughs> I happened to hear that there were a number of people in Burlington interested in buying some of those old seats. Those old seats fell apart. As they tried to get the rivets out of the floor and stuff, they would crack, they would break. There was probably something that was broke that we didn't know was broke. They were just sort of sitting there. So uh, there wasn't, they wasn't any hope. You did uh, have, so they, those were also Wake Forest colors. There you go, Wake Forest. Okay, so <laughs> I can find other people to blame it on as well. Uh, but no, that and the carpets are the carpet squares. So if a spill gets happening, if something happens to one, you peel up a square or two, stick them back down. We bought attic stock, so we'd have some for the next few years. Uh, the auditorium restrooms, the one in the center, that was basically the male restroom with a urinal. Now on your left and on your right uh, is your new restrooms. On the right, you you see you have a wash area. On the left, uh, you have a series of styles. On the opposite wall, there's a series of urinals. The female restroom looks very similar without the urinals. So, uh, uh, something we don't have a picture of, but you've seen before, is we got two really nice restrooms in the cafeteria now at Williams. You know, Williams had no restrooms anywhere close to their cafeteria. So there's two really nice restrooms. And we use the same white tile. Uh, it's easy to clean. Plus, it's been here forever, so if something happens, you don't end up with what you end up with now. You, know, you got one color, then something a little different. Uh, that's a standard white. So we've, we tried to keep everything standard throughout the project, as well as we bought attic stock. So now we got attic stock that we can use at any of our schools because it is the same tile. Okay. If I'm going too slow, if I'm boring you, please tell me, but I'm just trying to, to cover some of the questions <laughs> I've, I've been asked. Uh, Graham High School. It's got a substantial completion date of 10-11. So that was last week. Um, they met that. They have a completion date of 12-10. They are uh, definitely on track as long as they continue with the schedules that they've provided us. <coughs> we had a bond, a bond budget of $7,619,000. Uh, dollars and or and sixty three dollars our construction lap project was five million eight hundred and fifty thousand owners uh one point one point seven uh, almost one point eight million dollars the good news about that particular project we're under budget one point five almost one point six million dollars now some things we'll, we'll talk a little bit about as we go through this and such. Again, it will be talked with both boards as well as our TRC and our oversight committee. Uh, but here's some pictures of Graham High School. Uh, really got some nice signage. Uh, that signage also reflects the wall that we used around a portion of the school, around the whole school. Uh, top left, that's actually the front of the school now. Instead of seeing the end of each of those buildings, uh, you see that particular wall. It shades you from the road for somebody just getting out, walking in. So the picture to the bottom left is walking down the main sidewalk, looking out. Uh, once we get grass back there, that'll be a really nice commons area for kids. Top right, uh, again, looking out to the wall, you see there's some concrete uh, picnic tables. Uh, we're finding out more and more of our students want to eat outside, uh, even in bad weather. Uh, like a day like today where it's been raining, 
A lot of times they still want to eat outside, so we're trying to create coverage where we can. But most definitely we're trying to make sure we got picnic tables so they can do that. Bottom right is your fire truck storage area. Before we were just packing the fire truck right straight into one of our labs. So it was constantly in the way, constantly just having to work around it. So now it has its own home, own particular place it goes, as well as their storage for their equipment. Uh, never realized how much equipment it takes to train uh, the firefighting, EMS. So now they have a particular area where they can actually store that. So here's classrooms as well as shops. Uh, they've come a long way since these pictures. Remember these pictures were made right before students came back. Uh, these are the most up-to-date welding cubicles you can get. Uh, they are designed to bring in fresh air, take out the bad air, as well as it's, you see the yellow, an instructor can walk through with their mask on, still see what they're doing. Uh, it is capable of handling pretty much any piece of equipment we put in there as far as welding equipment goes. So a really nice asset, very nice plus to our Graham High School. Uh, ACC is planning on doing some classes there and is very excited about having this quality of equipment. So here's our shop areas. Uh, I wish I had some before pictures uh, because they were, ma they were makeshift dust collectors in a lot of these. I mean, just tubes running with a suction or vacuum. and uh, So now you can see very organized. Uh, the equipment's not organized. Again, this is before students come back. Uh, but just very organized. The there's drops for each piece of equipment. There's the actual power they need in the floor for each piece of equipment. Uh, so a lot of the things that were a hindrance for our programs has been removed. Uh, restrooms and water fountains. There's a good picture of the restroom, though it's not military style. Uh, there are petitions up there now. Uh, we do have the epoxy floors. Again, white tiles. Uh, our water fountains, our new water fountains. Uh, we have bottle, we're putting the bottle refills. That seems to be a big thing with everyone nowadays as well as the kids carrying their little metal bottles or their bottles and wanting to refill. So we made that available for them. The epoxy floor, you know, you're talking that's gonna be there for another 20, 30 years. Uh, it's very easy to maintain, very easy to take care of. Uh, so our new high school, that's the only picture I have. Uh, I bore so many of you with my pictures of my electrical and my uh, the stuff that I get excited about, uh, that's the only picture we have. But it's come a long way since then. The masonry work's about finished. They're actually starting to paint some in the classrooms and the hallways. They're trying to finish a hall at a time. Uh, so we're going back now and saying, ooh, we probably should have done that. Can we go ahead and just take care of that while we're here? And, uh, again, y'all know we're working with Sam. At, they're a really good company to work with. So we're able to work through some stuff that uh, may have been issues with other folks. The um, new high school is southeast. I got to get, I, I called it new high school so long, calling it southeast is, is difficult. Uh, so, if you remember correctly, we had a little over a $58 million contract on that one. We only had $67 million slated. The commissioners were very gracious and helped us out with the vocational building and the road improvements. So, that's part of the $58 million. Uh, we had about eight and a half million dollar owners, which again, that's design, that's testing. Uh, there's a lot of testing on the new high school, a lot of uh, extra eyes, and that's our third parties, which as a school system, as a county, we won't because they're evaluating what the contractors do. <clears throat> and remember, we also purchased the land. Uh, the purchase price on it was about two point, a little over $2.2 .2 million. And I still haven't sent you my bill for the brokerage fee, but uh, that's, that, that's coming in the near future. Uh, no, we did choose not to use a broker because we wanted to uh, keep as much money in the county and into us as we could. Uh, so Jimmy Russell and myself, we spent a lot of time with Mr. Fuller. And he's a great guy. Uh, that's a CM at risk. And as you know, that one would not, uh, we, we're using the full amount. Again, we hope for a positive change order when it's over. Uh, but again, I'm going to say it again. You've heard it a thousand times. You know what the price of stuff is done. Uh, and uh, we think we're going to be fine and we're going to finish on time. 
So that one, we should be in the building. We should have substantial completion 527. We're ahead of that schedule. And we will have uh, full completion on 725, which, like I said, we are we are in good shape. Uh, we're all dried again, so rain is no longer a factor. The mud is a factor, but the rain's not. 723 off 2023. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. To your build. <laughs> uh, this is, and that's, that's a lot of square footage yeah. for a two year build. Okay, so Eastern High School. Just to give you some information from Eastern. We have a substantial completion date of 113.23, a completion date of 310.23. We're definitely ahead of schedule on this particular project. I mean, although it looks like there's a lot, there's a lot of concrete that we got to put down, which will go down fairly quickly. Uh, but they're working diligently on that cafeteria. They chose to do that cafeteria last on that project because of the subs. Uh, you only have so many subs, and you can only share them so far. <coughs> So we had a bond budget of 11.6 and some change. Uh, ended up with a construction budget of 9.5, owners of 2.1. Right now, uh, we are under on the construction budget of about 1.4 million. So uh, again, we're, we're very fortunate, guys. We're very fortunate. We're not talking about a different path on these projects. Um, Todd, did yes, you cut those trees down at that tennis court? that I might have asked you about numerous yes. times. Yes, they're, they're, they're scheduled. Thank you. They are scheduled, yes ma'am. So here's Eastern, just to give you a little quick preview. The picture on the left is looking up to the new building. Uh, picture in the middle is the front of our new building. So now when you pull up to Eastern, you can't help but know where the front of the school is. It, it's no longer, hey, I wonder which, hall, which path I go <laughs> up. And Y'all have all been there, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the front there to the left that's that's come a long ways but that's your new entrance coming in again that identifies where you come in at to the bottom right that's a little roll roof we put in there just to give it some character um, the only place we used any architectural design was right in the entrance way once they got past the entrance way no I'm not gonna do your, your crazy stuff we understand the school needs to really look nice when you walk in but the rest of it can be standard construction it still looks very nice very clean it just doesn't have the high ceilings and the stuff that becomes issues for us. So pictures of the new building, conference room, there's your front with your entranceway or your secure vestibule. There's, it has a classroom in that particular building. Uh, so there is a classroom and top left is your uh, workroom. Now they're getting more classrooms than that. Their student services suite is moving into the old administrative office area. Uh, that's a nice area to put two really nice classrooms. They have two other rooms that have partial break room, partial offices. Uh, those are being converted back into full classrooms because we do have spaces in that old admin area. So what we're trying to do instead of re renovating so many areas is renovate what we can to classrooms and use our existing office space. So it's a trade-off. So your security wall, uh, that picture in the center, that's where you used to have the about 14 foot sidewalk that you just walked up to and uh, Mr. Lashley, who is there, you know, you're there but you really don't know where you're at. So now that has a, that's a gated area. So folks just won't wander in. It still has the crash bar so people can get out if there would be a reason to have to get out quickly. Uh, again, there's your awnings. Looks very nice. And I meant to say, I forgot to say this at Southern, but also at Eastern. This resolved our ADA issues, where before we had steps and we had ramps that were too uh, steep. We were able to bring everything up to grade and use a steady ramp going down both of those. So there are no longer any steps. So Pleasant Grove. <coughs> Pleasant Grove has a Substantial completion of 630.23. A, um, excuse me, I got that backwards. Substantial completion of 430.23. A completion of 630.23. Uh, it is definitely on schedule. It's moving really well. 
these guys did an excellent job for us this summer. Uh, if you'd have walked in the building with me day one after the kids had left and seen all the ceiling laying on the ground, all the piping coming down, everything you could possibly think of, and walked in there the day we opened up for kids, there's a lot of work happening in 10 weeks there. <coughs> so the the bond budget was six million four seventy four. We had a construction our construction budget ended up at four eight sixty five oh two. Our owner's expense was one million six thirteen six ninety, which put us over one hundred eighty nine three twenty seven, but you never noticed that. We were able to go into our owner's budget and identify some areas that we what okay the architect uses percentages when they give you these things such as testing uh, we didn't need as much testing as well as we were able to take care of some of the abatement ourselves so it's just a shift of money so it's back to being on budget and on time but if you if you look at my sheet that i'm reading from it'll show that you're over 189 327 but in reality, you're not. You're still well within the bond budget that we set for that scope. Uh, so Pleasant Grove. To the left is their new reception area. If uh, any of you ever been to Pleasant Grove, you used to walk in, and again, it was one of those schools you could go anywhere you wanted to go. Uh, so now what you're seeing with the blue tape, and uh, again, it's come a long ways. That is where those two little doors were that were taken down years ago, that now the doors are back up, so now it creates a safety vestibule. There to the left, uh, you see the hole cut, that's where the transaction window goes in at. And right to the left of it, there's a door that leads into your office. So everything is controlled again from that safety vestibule. Uh, the interior of the schools. To the left, uh, you remember we had to put the new gym floor down. We took it out of the bond because uh, our guys or our contractors could do it with a much more reasonable cost. So that is your new gym floor. To the right, if you if you remember, it was dingy, it was gray, the walls were uh, just in really bad shape. So now it has all a fresh coat of paint. It's got your green stripe. Um, we do allow them to put their colors. Uh, we changed our mind after the first two or three paint jobs because if they're put right where book bags drag, it begins scarring and looking bad. I knew I'd get a... <sighs> Mr. Lash, I was looking for that when I was looking for that one. Uh, so we learned if you put them high, they stay looking really nice and they're much more durable. So And it also makes the house, it just sort of breaks up the house. So the restrooms there, they have one, they actually have one community restroom in that school, but you know, it's an extremely small school. So what you're seeing there, now that, again, petitions have been installed. Uh, we pulled everything out, cleaned the floors, put epoxies down on the floor. It had an epoxy, but it was the old school epoxy, real thin, just uh, more like a paint. <coughs> so we was able to really make those restrooms nice and usable. In the center, uh, I think we was able to put restrooms in nine of the classrooms, which helped some with the bathroom usage. We wish we could have put them in all of them, but there was restrictions uh, that we couldn't. But uh, so nine of the K3 wing now has restrooms in the classroom. The HVAC, again, this is a picture that bores most folks, but these two silver pipes you see coming up, that's insulation you see on the outside of Galvanized Pipe. Uh, but that is the new HVAC system, and we had to find a classroom that we could take two corners and bring in the main trunk lines. So that's where they came in at. This is the typical classroom. The one on the left does not have a restroom in it, so it has more casework. The one on the right, you see the restroom there on the left-hand side. Uh, the casework's a little shorter, but they do have piping. Uh, this project is an ongoing project. There'll be a lot going on out there over breaks, uh, different opportunities. Right now we have uh, about 100 of the Pleasant Grove kids at South Melbourne. We're busing and transporting every day. It's working very smoothly and very nicely. But they have that whole bottom hall, the new, the new wing, which is what, 60s? Uh, they're in there taking care of that as they go. So. When those students return right after Christmas break, 
uh, they'll be returning into new uh, classrooms. And I'm assuming their teachers went with them. No, we just, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> right, if you really want to make it difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. And, and like I said, everything's going really smooth. We, awesome. we, we knew it would. There's going to be some apprehension to start with. But that, uh, you know, school districts do this all the time. As a matter of fact, Alamance Broden Schools have done it when they use Seller's Gun to relocate kids for different uh, remodels and stuff. So uh, it's gone very well. So Western High School. Uh, substantial completion, 11-11-22. Uh, completion date of 1-10-23. We are ahead of the schedule. Uh, mind of fact, we're starting to finish the floors in the new building, so when you start finishing floors, you're finished. Uh, so, it's, we had a bond budget of $12,400,000, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm $12,400,000, if you want to get exact. I, you've seen these numbers, so I'm just trying to remind you where we hit at in the, in the big scheme of stuff. Um, our construction budget was ten five. We had about 2.4 million for owners, and this project is doing very well. Uh, we're looking to be a little over 2 million under budget. So. Um, those plastic tubes on the outside of those buildings, that I used to refer to them as hamster tubes, did you get rid of them for drainage? Oh, I tore up the whole canopy. Okay, thank you. That's all gone. Okay. Uh, so, new building. Again, this is our classroom building. Uh, we are to the point that we're doing, we're doing the floors, so it's uh, moving right along. Awnings, there's, there's your awnings where your squirrel cages used to be or your hamster cages. Mm -hmm. You see they're all gone. That's just absolutely beautiful. It's made a world of difference. Uh, cafeteria. Restrooms. Yeah, I could about make pictures of the school and just replace them in different ones because we did things so similar, but there are a reason for that, a maintenance reason for that, as well as a repair reason for that. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's much more efficient. That's what we need is efficiency in everything we do. Efficiency as well as then it still, it still looks like a clean new space. When you start putting tiles in that don't match and stuff, it, the space begins to look dirty. And, you know, you kind of treat space the way you see it. If it's clean and it's nice, most people try to keep it clean and nice. Uh, Cummins. Substantial completion, 210-23. A completion of 4623. It is on schedule. Uh, it had a construction budget of about 85, 8.5 million. We had about a 2.3 million owner's expense. It is gonna come in under budget uh, of about $900,000. Now this particular project, we are watching it on a very close basis. Uh, if they follow the schedule they have, they're going to be fine on their completion. If they're not, we're going to have to have different conversations with them. But right now, they are on time and slightly under budget. But Cummins, uh, just quickly, to the left, the ones who toured the school, and I know Mr. Paisley had, uh, Ms. Thompson has, uh, Mr. Carter, back when, before we tore out and started doing a lot. So the picture on the left is the new staircase um, glass we put in. If you remember correctly, it, it had rotted out over the years, uh, had a lot of issues, safety issues, as well as structural issues. So that's what we did at every staircase. This just happens to be the one going into the gym. On the right is your auditorium. So it does have the larger lobby going into the auditorium. What? Okay. Uh, the safety vestibule. So when you walk through the front doors now, you have another set of doors, so it has, a, it has a large vestibule, and they all look different depending on what space we had to work with. Uh, to the left, of, 
either one of these two pictures. There's a entrance into the office as well as a a access point as far as dropping stuff off. The one in the uh, far right, that's just a picture on the staircase looking down. So you can see where we added the doors at there at the entrance. Uh, the restrooms, so to the left is one example of the restrooms that was there. Uh, you see your multicolor floors. Many of them had multicolor walls. Many of them had tiles that were uh, not matching, uh, looked very rough. Also, so to the middle picture, you got your epoxy floor. Again, the same white tile we've used everywhere else. To the right, although it's a picture of the white tile, but if you look at the ceiling, those, those schools were built with drop ceilings, which become a point of kids wanting to tap them out uh, and or hide stuff in them. So now we have a solid ceiling, so there's no access. <laughs> uh, in the front of the school, and yes, we, do ha we did have a bent pole. Uh, cement truck backed into it, but that got replaced. But when you pulled up to Cummins, if you remember, you had 100 miles of no way to get out of the weather. So now you got this really nice black awning that goes up the sidewalk as well as goes into the circle. So when kids are entering or exit, they can get out of the rain. With the pole, it was bent. I assume that's been correct. Sir? The pole really was bent. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, the, the concrete company is responsible for that. So, yeah, it was ordered. And, uh, but I hadn't looked at it. I need to go by and look and see. I, they were supposed to replace it a lot, few weeks ago, so I'll go by and double check well, it. Are putting guards in front of these posts now? We, we have talked about it, and we think it may be something that we have to go back and do kind of after this construction project, but to go back and do that cement uh, surround just so people can't bump into them. Even in my office, when we put the uh, awning on the back, we had to put substantial posts there to keep people from driving into them. Yeah, people get a little close, not paying attention. Yes, sir, that happens. You'd be surprised what a pull about that diameter filled with concrete will do to prevent that. Yes, sir. I agree. <laughs> Does quite a bit. Yes, quite a bit of damage to the car. So the only project I have not talked about so far tonight is the South Melbourne project. Uh, as you know, it's complete. Uh, there's still some punch list stuff that we're going to continue to work on. And it was he come in 539000 under budget. So we are doing the closeout documents for it. We are expecting about a $177,000 positive change order. Now, don't get too excited. Uh, we, we chose to pull some abatement and tile out of the contract. Again, their rates plus their overhead and profit was a lot more than what I could do it for. So we took that project on ourselves. So we will have the abatement uh, done this summer and the tile put in. So although it's a positive change order, we know it's coming, uh, but we do expect to spend quite a bit less than $177,000 to do it. So, so and, and you've heard that come from me several times throughout uh, these bond presentations when we talked about them that, you know, we, do, we did choose. Like South Melbourne, that's another one we chose to pull the gym floor out because we have contacts that would do it cheaper for us and anytime you hire a contractor they've got their profit and overhead and they're going to add it to the change order they're going to make sure they get their and that's how they stay in business uh it's usually a, a small amount but again if we can save it and put it towards another project we'll put it towards another project so what uh, i'm gonna tell you what i'm thinking uh my board chair is behind me and I got five in front of me, so y'all may throw something at me, but it won't be the first time. I'm okay with that. Uh, and I feel like I've taken way too much time, guys. Y'all, you know to tell me, hurry up if I need to. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. Tell me to roll on. I'm okay with that. You have I, a lot to be proud of. I, I think it's great that everybody sees where their money's going. I'm trying to get us, uh, give you as much information, get the public as much information, get everybody as much information. So what uh, I'm going to propose, and you're going to hear it come up in the TRCs and oversight, and we're just we're too early to, to really talk about the $8 million that we may possibly have from projects coming in less. We're, we're just way too early to talk about what to do with that kind of money at this point because these projects haven't closed out. And, again, the economy is so unstable. So let's right. 
But what uh, I've told my team, and we're going to start, go ahead and get ahead of the game, is where this money's been assigned to certain schools, what else do we need to do at that particular school? Need to do, not want to do. What do we need to do? Does it need new doors? Because we do have a lot of doors going out. Does it need some roofing work? You know, do I need to get a plan together and come back and let's have a conversation formally about funding new roofing? But to take that money and just put it right back in those sites. But if we have additional funds, we don't need to decide, which I'll be honest with you, I don't really see that. Uh, if we do have that, let's talk about what we can do at other sites. And one for a prime example, you know, Graham High School, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have the funding to remove the lockers and change the floor. And we didn't have the funding in there to redo the awnings there. Uh, it is a lower capacity school. It does have fewer kids in it. We were able to repair the awnings and put drainage in, in into the ones that's there. So if we do have funding left, let's talk about what can we do there to mirror what we did at some of our other schools. And again, that was strictly a funding decision that had to be made. Uh, we've got Southern High School that we got funds right now to redo the camera system as far as the new and the additions. Uh, but, you know, we need to do a, a little more major upgrade there at that particular school. So we may be talking about, hey, can we take some of these funds or let's, let's talk about what that would look like. That's normally a small number. So we really want to spend some time digesting what's there, uh, looking back at some records, getting some good numbers, uh, as well as work with our engineers to uh, come up with some good numbers to uh, make all this happen for everyone. I think that's fair for the people who voted for the bond and fair for the schools. Uh, so, I mean, if anybody's got a different opinion, you know, I welcome that, uh, either here tonight or some other time. But I think, you know, if that's how we're going to start to proceed. And if we get turned around, we get turned around. Well, uh, so you're asking us tonight to approve from your uh, capital reserve fund eight million eight thousand two hundred twenty-seven dollars and fifty cents. I'll pay the fifty number? cent. I'll pay the fifty cent. Don't worry about it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I, these projects and they, they've been sitting out here, and like I said, we do know if we don't get these locked in really quick, we're just going to be dealing with another price increase. Uh, so the more projects we can lock in, uh, we do have um, AW, EM Holt packaged up, ready for DOT. So maybe we can get reimbursement for those. You know. Because we can't do this work till summer anyway, but if I at least have the access of the funds, I can go ahead and get under contract with it. Then if DOT funds 750000 that means I'll be telling you I don't need $750,000 out of 830000 So yeah, the, the key to it is for me to get them locked in under a contract. And like I said, if we get funding back or if DOT approves the funding, I'll be the first to tell you, hey, we don't need that money. We may need it somewhere else, but we don't need it to complete that project. But that's what you're asking. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, looking at pointing out our capital reserves. Am I correct in understanding that you're also saying that if, if these projects on some of these schools come in under budget, finally, then you can use some of that money for those in the lieu of the <coughs> 8 million that we're talking the, to about? To help fill in some of those gaps as well. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, yeah. Like it's I said, out of capital, your capital fund, right. anyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I like that's my capital fund. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it's coming out of the capital reserve funds. Uh, the, the county manager just gave me a look and tells me that I, I spoke incorrectly. <laughs> Come on, but uh, no, seriously. Uh, yes, that's what we're asking, and if, and if any way we can replenish that through any of our refunds, anything we bring back in under budget, and. Yeah, up until recently, I prided myself on getting stuff under budget. This is getting harder and harder to do that. Explain to the folks listening what the capital reserve fund is. Okay, so the capital reserve fund is a portion of sales tax that goes into a special account just for school systems. Uh, that money can be used for brick and mortar improvements and or improvements of the facilities. Uh, that's where it sits. We're sitting at a little over $12 million in that account. And Mr. Lashley and myself, I think, had this conversation several years ago, four to five million is where we need to sit if we ever have a major um, shutdown, as long as we're sitting on that between the four and five million, we feel comfortable, we can get a school back up and going, then wait on insurance to pay. All right, do, board, do we have a motion? I have a question. Yes, sir. Just because it's been batted around, and it's, it's 
I just want to uh, get an idea from your experience uh, what you have noticed. How long do these DOT projects have a turnaround? Okay, so that was part of our conversation Friday. What they assure us, as long as we have all our paperwork by December to them, it gets submitted at the March uh, traffic committee meeting. It's when we will know if it's approved or not. Once it's approved, they're just waiting on the receipts to, to refund the money. How long does it take, you know, to get a check in your hand once the paperwork? Well, I ask that same question. They don't give checks anymore. It's funds <laughs> <laughs> transfer. <laughs> Sorry, but... Uh, they said, they said <laughs> For both of us. they said normally That's about great. 90 days about 90 days once That's we it. get it submitted about 90 days they can get it processed oh, and get it to you, us you hear that right yeah. we were we were talking about it just wondering how long it takes for dot you know sometimes they're a little bit slow it, it appears to take forever to get to that point yeah. but once you get to that point it sounds like once it's approved they well that's that's good i, they, thought, they I thought it would be much longer well, i really thought minimum at, at minimum three years that's not what they, they, they told us they're working with a current budget. So, okay. uh, and we're hoping to see them increase that 750. Like I said, that's from a couple of years ago as a max. Uh, we'd love to see DOT take that in consideration and increase those numbers to a more realistic number of today. That looks good. Yeah. That, that's good. So if that turnaround's that quick. Um, I'm hopeful. That's all I can say. We just got to make sure we get our paperwork in on time. I get the paperwork in on time. I'm in control of that. Now, outside of that, I'm not in control of much, but I'm in control of getting that paperwork in. And I, and your I do board chair it. gave you a look on that one. <laughs> All right. They, they're going to have the retirement papers waiting on me when I get out of here after tonight's meeting. I don't think they're going to let that happen, Todd. Uh, well, I would even make sure. Do we have a motion board? Motion to approve. Second. A motion to second. Any further discussion? I have a discussion in the form of qu a few questions uh, sure. for Dr. Thorpe. Uh, you mentioned for the DOT reimbursement that there were like there were essentially two buckets. One bucket is our projects that are reimbursable, and another project I think you called it like point spot mobility. Spot mobility. So which which of the ones on the list are projects that meet the eligibility in that? For the ones that's on the highway, for a true number. Yeah. The at Southeast High School, that was all uh, highway improvements. So, so that's, that's the 500. Six fifty-seven. Correct. Okay. Out of the southern, that's part of the piece that we're going through now because we're having to go back and separate it. So our, the subs are having to say, mm -hmm. this was the highway, this was the driveways, this was southern middle driveway. So we're breaking that down now. So okay. as soon as I get some true numbers on there, I'll be more than happy to share. So it would. Part of that would be reimbursable. The other part would be a spot. Spot, spot mobility is what spot they call it. Spot mobility. And so uh, it would be a portion of that or all of it, depending on whether DOT increases their 750. Right, right. Up to 750 or whatever their max number would be. Okay. Are there any other DOT reimbursables that are not spot mobility other than the those two? No, no, because okay. they, they've pushed it all over onto our land, onto our property. All right. So it's still a bit of question mark. When we get those reimbursed, whatever we get reimbursed, 90 days after March 23, those monies go back into the capital reserves? Yes, sir. So we replenish capital reserves based on DOT reimbursement, under budget projects that we're doing now, and additional sales tax monies that funds that based upon the allotment that this board created a couple years ago. Yes, sir. It'd be pretty much just about reimbursed for the whole $8 million, or maybe a little bit more, right? There's there's an opportunity. Title from all that under budget. Well, right at eight million dollars for the bond stuff. And, and so, well, so there's that's a question though, because isn't as I understand it, bond funds are in a separate are in a separate fund. Bond let's call them bond savings. Isn't that a separate fund from capital reserves? Yes, sir. But you don't. You, you can can't mix those. You can reimburse yourself, like for the vocational building, if you choose to re reimburse yourself. You could reimburse yourself for that. 1.2 million, any highway money would not get returned. You could reimburse it out bond if you show, so chose to. But yes, outside of that, the bonds stay in a separate fund. Uh, we have seven years to spend them, if I remember correctly. And um, what's going to be really great, we're going to see some interest on these bonds too. So uh, we will have bond and bond interest, which will be some additional funds we can put towards projects. And 150 million, that's pretty good interest coming in, I imagine. Okay, and the last set of questions on the on the bond savings. 
You mentioned for South Mebane that you were about to close that out. Yes, sir. All right, and so that's five hundred thirty-nine thousand dollars. About the anticipate, maybe more, but that's what you anticipate w would be a bond savings for that project. Correct. Once that project's closed out, is that five hundred thirty-nine thousand dollars or more, whatever it is, mm -hmm. does that become eligible for allocation? The the way we sold the bonds, it does. Okay. Because we sold the bonds as a general bond, we just identified the projects as the projects we're focusing on. Right. So that five hundred and thirty, whatever thousand dollars, could be reallocated to another. Okay. But so now let me let me just throw a little flip on I, that too. I, 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 I got you. I'm I, good. I uh, we do have some roofing there that has to be replaced. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so our recommendation will be to our board, to this board, the TRC and oversight committee, that uh, we take those funds and for it, put it towards. Uh, some of the roofing that needs to be replaced there. So, if let's use Williams High School as an example. Okay. The finish date is eleven twenty-five. How far out of eleven twenty-five is closeout when those funds will become eligible for allocation? Somewhere? When they become truly money, we know we have. Let's go that because. Okay. Um, so how far generally from close out to knowing that typically time? once you got your completion date it's going to take anywhere from 60 to 90 days to get all the uh, final documents go through the final documents uh, you know not that we don't trust people we don't trust people so we will go through and make sure their numbers match what our numbers are we have some pretty extensive uh, spreadsheets we keep of this stuff so we'll make sure their numbers match our numbers and at that point I'll be going to the boards to the, again TRC oversight saying this project's closed, we're done. This is how much money's left in the kitty at that particular school. Thirty days, sixty days, ninety days. It's about ninety days, like I said, after completion. Okay. Between sixty and ninety days by the time we we have the opportunity to feel very comfortable. And the last question is if I, I, I'm going to support your funding request, but what, once once that vote is done. And so, for instance, the Grand Middle Roofing project is approved. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have the materials yet. I don't have total design at this point because I'm not. I don't put out a lot of money for design if I can't get funding. So what I have is some of it. I'll go ahead and do a 30 uh, 30 percent completion. That gives you a really strong number. Uh, some of it I do so much work with the engineers. They will come in and give me. Uh, basically on their dime do the core samples and take some measurements and go ahead and give me what a fair market um, price would be at worst I always ask for it worst case scenario but, but when does the money leave capital reserves and goes to a, to a contractor it will not leave until they the contract itself and y'all are more aware of this than I am is written at certain points to where there's points of completion so if you take wood alone for an example, that contract was approved in February. Not a nickel of it has gone to the contractor at this point, so it's still sitting in our capital reserve account here. You know, it's been line itemed out into us for that particular project, but it will sit there until that we get at least a certain percentage, and typically that's that 30 percent. I can see some future contracts coming uh, just from meeting folks that's doing the same work as I do. You know, some contractors are starting to require a payment much earlier uh, right. such as when materials are on ground uh, which that's fair that's fine you've got the materials you got them secured but they're starting to look for payments a little bit earlier just because they've got a lot of money invested as well but you got to have a sign off from the architect or engineer before these are released anyway yes well what typically happens is they'll do a pay app we we do 90 percent of our large projects under pay apps that way the project manager says we're here uh, if we're doing roofing, we do a lot with REI. John from REI, he says, yes, they're there. Then it comes to my desk, and at that point, I'm probably the, the worst to say, I don't understand why this money's here. It'll tell me where we're coming from. Tell me where it's going. And then I sign off, and then it goes through the process and ends up over here. So it's a process to get them paid, but uh, there's a lot of eyes looking at those well, pays. The point of that question is to say that just because we allocate, if we do $8 million tonight, that doesn't mean that tomorrow $8 million is gone from that account. No, no, no. That, Let's, that, that's going to dole out over time. The, the, in the meantime, that fund has an opportunity to replenish itself. And so if, if there's some concern about getting low on the capital reserve fund, uh, that, that's, that, that's fixed a bit by the fact that correct. we're not 
throwing this out the door. Correct, because like I said, when they go sign a design, it's going to take three to six months, depending on the size of the job, to get the final design on it. So, uh, honestly, in today's market, you approve it tonight, it'll be a year before I even tap into it, unless I tap into just a little bit for design work. Well, which begs the question, should we start weeding these things a little sooner? Uh, yes, sir. That's what I'm, we're, we're going to have to start predicting stuff, like I said, two to three years out. Uh, we nurse chillers that we got ordered. Uh, we nurse chillers all summer, which is very expensive. Mm. So we had to nurse them to keep schools up and get this through. Thank goodness we're finally past that, and the chillers should be here in the next couple months. Uh, and so the last thing I'll say, Mr. Chairman, is that respectfully, Dr. Torp, I, I, I thank you very much. This has been a great presentation Good. and great information for the, for the community. I disagree with your approach, though, on allocation of bond savings. Okay. Um, I think we've got a, a top 10 list that identifies the top priorities of what capital spending uh, should be for the schools. That means those are our top priorities, and then we ought to focus savings on those. That's my opinion. We can have that debate. I just and, want to be on the record. And, and, I, and I would say to this, we've kept some of these off the top 10 lists because we knew the bonds were there. So they, they, this, this is up for a whole different discussion. Uh, like I said, we... We know that uh, Western, we got to put a roof on a couple buildings there. We know we got to do it. Uh, we were just trying to hold out till we see where we were with the bonds, so we weren't coming back to ask you different money. And, and I agree, top 10 is what we said. Uh, we just got a few more that's going to probably slide in there in that same top 10 category. But probably at any point in time with this many sites, that top 10 can change instantly. Yes, ma'am. It's. Uh, it's kind of like those chillers that were going out that we've lost here recently. Nobody projected it. They, in a normal lifespan, they probably should have had another couple of years. But for some reason, they decided they, they were done. And then when your cost to repair becomes more than the cost to replace, yeah. now we're just throwing good money at a bad problem. Yeah. Board, any other questions before we call the question? Just an observation, I believe. Won't we'll still have over four million dollars in the capital reserve, even after we, even if the money didn't come back, we'd still be about where we need to be in capital reserve mm -hmm. at about four and a half million dollars. I, I try to stay very conscious. You know, like I said, we had a good discussion that night. I remember it very well. Four to five million dollars is where I think we all set that we said we felt really comfortable. As long as we have that, as something would go down. So. Yeah, we have a motion on the floor. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed is unanimous. Thank you, and I, I apologize for taking so much in the meeting. Thank you. Can I ask one question about SROs? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Dr. Thorpe, I understand. Can you tell me what the SRO situation is at Andrews Elementary? Okay, I actually had to inquire about that today. Uh, they are, uh, like other places, struggling to find people to work, so they're using a split position between uh, CTEC, which is on the same property. Uh, CTEC, he's traveling back and forth from Andrews to CTEC at this point. Uh, we're hoping they'll have someone hired and trained in the next 90 days. Okay. Yeah, we're going to take a 10 minute break. We're back in session. And Mr. Stevens. Yes, sir. Um, so presentation tonight for the board related to an ongoing effort that uh, T. Campbell started months ago, just updating on a systematic basis um, various ordinances in the county that need to be addressed and modernized and updated. Uh, the first one for you guys tonight uh, is the recycling and the solid waste ordinance. Uh, each of these are in need of review because of the fact that it's been 20 years for the solid waste ordinance. Right. 13 years for the recycling ordinance since these have been updated in a really um, cogent way. So we will say that we've updated these in the recent past related to SB 300 that passed last year that made a requirement for any ordinance with a criminal penalty to be updated to reflect that penalty and be voted on in a second meeting. Well, this is not necessarily to do that. There are also no new fees associated with these ordinances. But because the criminal penalties that existed before are going to continue to exist, this is really just a presentation to, of the ordinances and the drafts of those to you guys to review. It'll have to be another meeting before you can actually vote to approve those. So there'll be no board action to be taken on these tonight. Again, like I said, the recycling ordinance has been 13 years. Solid waste has been 20 years. Um, the biggest changes have been to update the current policies and procedures that are reflected in the ordinance with what we're actually doing. Uh, also removed some definitions that weren't needed. 
and also to lay the stage for uh, licensing for solid waste here in the county. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have any questions, I I'll tell you also, I know it came up earlier, the Gray Fox properties and there was some allusion to the solid waste ordinance. Uh, first, I wanna let you know that our staff here at the county is already aware of some of the issues related to the properties that were brought before the board. Mm -hmm. So we're aware of those ongoing issues and our staff is working to help abate those issues. Um, but that's really all we have for you tonight. Unless you have questions, uh, this is another meeting issue. We'll have to vote on another meeting. Uh, wait till another meeting to vote on the adoption of these ordinances. So you're presenting those to us tonight. It will require a second meeting on November the 7th. Correct, okay. yes. So we have to present at one meeting and then vote on the adoption of the ordinance at the second meeting because of the fact there are criminal penalties involved in each of these ordinances. Any questions for me now? Are there any substantive changes to the new ordinance? Really no substantive changes. Um, there's some deletions, um, especially related to definitions that weren't used, uh, but really just to bring things into conformity with the policy and procedure. Uh, also to change some of the things that the health department used to do related to solid waste and bring that into alignment with the new solid waste department that we have here. But really, in terms of how business is done, there are no new fees, no new criminal penalties, so nothing really substantive as far as changes. The penalties are back are the same, if I've read mm -hmm. them correctly. Correct. Penalties are the same, fees are the same, so no real substantive changes. We have our health director present. Do you want to comment, or are you good? No <laughs> comment. <laughs> Thank you. Just wanted to give you a chance if you needed to. He's glad to be shed of something, right? <laughs> Rick, I do have a question. Sure. Uh, just because it begs 20 years and 13 years. Um, shouldn't we increase the penalties and fees? Isn't that long? Um, some of the penalties are, are set by statute. That's what I was okay. going to say. Um, so there, there's oftentimes a limit to what can actually be imposed. I can't really speak to whether or not the fees should be looked at other than to say that's going to require some substantive action. The effort here was not to do that. The effort here was to make sure we're aligning things correctly. So at some point in the future, the board might consider a new fee structure, but that's not really appropriate for what we're trying to do in this instance. Perfect. And I'll tell you too, we're going to be having um, some of these types of ventures over the next few months. I didn't want to overload the board with new ordinances to consider. But we're going to have others in the near future to look at because, like you also said, 13 years, 20 years, that's too long. Um, for really any ordinance that we're using on a daily basis, we ought to be looking at it more frequently than that. I think the recycling, the $500 penalty, I think that's set by 14 4, is it not? Correct, yes. A lot of times those are set by statute. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Anything Thank else? you, sir. Anyone else? Great. Thank you. Miss Atkins, and we're going to give you four and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the dude's got well, how many a lot pages? Books. 300 and what? <laughs> I'll try to read quickly. Okay. <laughs> the 382 pages and the, the yeah. schedule of values was, uh, yeah. a, a, that was a heavy duty reading. Uh huh. Yeah. I, I wouldn't want to have your job. Thank you. Uh, I mean, you have to know all that stuff. I, I'm a geek enough that I enjoy it. <laughs> That's where I'm going to have to discipline myself not to just share every detail with you. I'm sure you want the abbreviated version. Well, and, uh, earlier today, I, huh? I saw those, and mm -hmm. I was afraid you were going to <laughs> see that again. That's right. That's well, right. I got my own book now. Uh, there I you go. I got my own book now. I mean, if it's I get tabbed out for if reference. If I can't sleep at night, I have a remedy for that. You can highlight it. You can put the little red stickers in there. You can find what you're looking for. Yeah. That means you're street legal, Bill. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tilt this just a little bit. You can put it okay. wherever you want. Hey, I mean, you can consume that overnight. You know, I'm it's sure, it's right? so amazing after years of having one screen, it's I'm just kidding. trained if you, if you're to not point a, if you're over not there. there. And then I realize there's yeah, one over there. I get very confused now. All right, well, we'll get started. And I do want to introduce uh, Ryan Vincent of Vincent Valuations, uh, who has um, done most of the work with the schedule. I've had a few tweaks, a few inputs, but uh, the bulk of the work has been his, and I've been very happy kind of looking over his shoulder, seeing what's happening, and, and testing it, applying it, seeing what it does. I think that uh, they've done a very good job, and uh, proud to present it to you this evening. Find out which button is the button. 
So to start out, I did want to touch on what is a schedule of values because in my mind, when I hear schedule, I think about time, you know, being on schedule. But a schedule of values is, is not that. Um, it's a pricing guide. It's a part rate table and part manual, if you want to think about it. When you take the schedule, it gives you the, the tools that you need to value properties. Uh, it's our standards that we follow. General Statute 105.317B states, in preparation for each revaluation, it shall be the duty of the assessor to see that uniform schedules of values, standards, and rules to be used in appraising real property at its true value and at its present use value are prepared and sufficiently detailed to enable those making appraisals to adhere to them in appraising real property. So that's what the law defines as the schedule. Consistent application is the goal. So we've got nine appraisers looking at 75,000 parcels. If you don't have something to keep them all on the same page, you're going to begin to get variant approaches and inconsistent values. And we have to be very consistent. A good schedule of values brings all the appraisers onto the same page to make sure we're following the same standard of work. And how many appraisers? Eleven. Nine. Nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That includes commercial and present use. We have six residential and two present use and one commercial. Mm -hmm. So how is the schedule developed? So market research is performed. Uh, the market is the basis for everything we do. Specifically, we're looking at construction cost data, we're looking at sales data, and we're looking at income data. So with construction data, that provides us the current cost of the components of a new home. And here I'm speaking residentially because that's the, the bulk of uh, my focus. Obviously, commercial has the same situation. Um, this can be sourced from manuals, from online pricing services, and from local builders. Uh, we have reached out to local builders. You want that to be specific to your market. Sales data provides an overall rate at which properties sell. So this is useful to see if your model is working because you don't want to develop a model that, that looks good on paper, but then it's not predictive. You can't get reasonable values out of it. And the sales are going to tell you if it's working or if it needs calibration. Another important thing about sales is you can get depreciation from this. So if you're working with only construction data, that tells you about a new improvement. But what happens to it in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years? What, how does depreciation work in your market? Well, sales tell you that because you have sales of properties of, of all ages. And so that's very important to building the schedule. Income data connects the decision-making process of investors to the income-producing assets that they choose to purchase. Uh, some of this is very easy to get a hold of online. We subscribe to some services that give us income and expense data. Uh, some of this is very difficult to get a hold of. In uh, years past, we've tried to solicit this from property owners, and what we've found is the sample size is so small as to be useless. Uh, only a handful of folks will just voluntarily say, here's my, my income, here's my expense data on the front end. And so we really, we don't invest in that anymore because it doesn't give us a return. Uh, instead, we work with the data that's readily available. On appeal, however, it's easy to get a hold of this information. If somebody doesn't like our value, they say, well, look at this. Here's my income. Here's my expenses. And so at that point, we definitely do consider that. And the schedule is built with a little bit of mobility in there so that if there is a problem, we can see it and address it. The accuracy of the valuation model is measured in real-world performance. Value predictions of the model are compared to actual sales, and we note the differences. And a good model is going to give you a low coefficient of dispersion and a price-related differential of about 100. Uh, these two statistical measures tell us about the pre precision of the model. And this model has produced uh, a very good result so far. Comparing it to my uh, model of 2017, as proud as I, I am of, of the 2017, this is superior. Um, it, it's tighter to the, the sales. And so I, I can tell that it is well constructed. You said something that kind of puzzled me. Just sure. Most real estate investors look for some sort of a, 
a, a, a typical range in the ROI mm -hmm. on the property. Mm -hmm. Can, is there not a way to just back into that using some, you know, maybe using a minimum ROI mm -hmm. to determine what the in investment value might be? Mm -hmm. So we do, with what uh, information we have available, build a table that gives us some uh, ranges that we use for income valuation. Right. Um, but it's, it's not precise. What we don't want to do is pick a number and then you're stuck with it because there are so many variances you, you deal with. So we actually pick a range that seems reasonable. Um, but well, again, that's kind of what I was saying, like a mm -hmm. minimum to a maximum sure. ROI. Mm -hmm. And that's built into the schedule. There's a table that provides ranges for different types of properties and, and what we would use. Mm -hmm. So one of the most important things that I want to talk about is market growth and the time adjustment. Uh, this is new from the 2017. I didn't talk about this at all in 2017. Didn't need to. Uh, but I've uh, reformatted my presentation to focus on this, probably give it the most weight. Um, this is uh, Heraclitus. No man ever steps into the same river twice, for it is not the same river, and he is not the same man. It's this idea that you, you, know, you step into the river, you step out, you step back in, but it's not the same river because the water you were just in is way down there now. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening with the market. The market is moving, so you can have a sale but if any time has passed, that's not the market, right? Um, this is from July 7th. Burlington area home prices rise 3.4% in June. Uh, houses for sale in high demand. Typical home listed 382,500, up 3.4% from the previous month, up 36.6% from June of the previous year. Median home listed for $176 a square foot. Mm -hmm. This is the reality that we're dealing with. Uh, this is a, a massive growth in the market. And so we have to take that into consideration. Well, time adjustment. some real contraction in that recently too. Not on the value front. Mm -hmm. So what I've been seeing is all the, all the precursors, right? I'm talking about the sales side, of course. Mm -hmm. All the precursors are there, so market time is extending, market transactions are dropping, we're getting uh, more sales that are below listing, still a minority of sales. Most sales are above listing at this point, but about a third are below listing. So we're seeing a lot of indicators of it wanting to turn. But what I learned in the 2009 revaluation leading up to that, the, the first question the appraisers had is, uh, where did all the sales go? Because we're analyzing the market and the sales start to dry up. And then back behind those dried up sales, values begin to follow down. In the beginning, price doesn't want to move. And so you just see this distension and this reduction in market volume. And finally, price begins to follow that. So we're in that phase. I, I definitely think that we have a decline coming. But as of right now, it, it, it hasn't hit on price, but it has hit on volume. We're already in a decline on volume. Right. Mm -hmm. So the question is, with our reappraisal for next year, mm -hmm. are we too early? Well, and this is the, the question. Um, as, as I'll uh, present as we go, I'm not predicting any decrease through the end of the year. I think that the increase we've seen is going to flatten out significantly. But I think the decrease is going to come next year. Uh, if we go forward with the values uh, as we're setting them, we will probably lock in around the top of the market. And then next year there will be a market decline. I don't know there will. I don't have a crystal ball, but that does seem to be the indicators Logical. out there. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I would predict a crash like we had in 2008. The biggest factor I'm concerned about with that is if the recession gets severe, if we have employment issues, people begin to default on mortgages and you get this chain reaction. That's what happened last time was the chain reaction started. Short the chain reaction, I think we just get a mild decline. We're being penalized. What, you, what all of us know, we're mm -hmm. currently being penalized annually. Mm -hmm. About 400,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because our rates are mm -hmm. too low. Too low. Uh, and, and really. Public utilities. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. So that's going to be a Sure. Yeah, and absolutely. That's probably why, why we probably have to speed this process up because the public mm -hmm. utilities are, mm -hmm. you know, they have quite a bit of land that's on their balance sheet. Yeah. And, and they have seen that mm -hmm. underwater. That's why they reached out to us and said, hey, look, 
business. It gives Get the it going. 400 k because you guys are taking too much time. Right. right. <laughs> well, and that's the idea is it keeps uh, the equity between them. So, mm -hmm. so uh, we have to use time adjustments. Anytime we work with sales, especially given the level of market growth, you can see the person setting the clock, actually probably setting it forward, taking an old sale and trying to bring it up to date. Um, we, we take the older sales, we try to project what would it be if it was in the current market. And our current market is, is actually a future market for us, January 1st of 2023. So we're, we're predicting forward. So I've got an example. So let's say in 2020, a home sells for $200,000, right? The next year, an identical home next door sells for two fifty. dollars and the next year, an identical home across the street sells for 300. This is the same home, Happy same right builder, now. right? Same location. And as an assessor, I have to assess the same value. I don't get to choose to, to put one at 300 because it has a 300 sale and one at 200 because it has a 200 sale. I don't get to do that. So if I'm gonna pick the same value, what do I do? Do I pick the middle number? Put the middle number on there. Right, and so I match the one in the middle, and I'm over on the one sale and under <coughs> on the other sale. But what's wrong with this picture? Where is the market? The market's at the three hundred thousand, mm -hmm. right? So, so I can't do that. Already underwater. Right. I've got to follow what the current market is. I do this with the time adjustment. So when we're working through our neighborhoods, trying to make sure that we're we're brought up to market. Uh, for simplicity, let's say that I adjust $50,000 per year for the effect of time on the market. The recent sale doesn't need any adjustment. It's still at $300,000. Last year's sale needs a $50,000 adjustment, so we're up to three hundred. dollars The prior year's sale is two years. That's a $100,000 adjustment. We're up to three hundred. dollars When I see these sales, I see three sales at $300,000, and I know that's my price. Now, of course, the person that paid 200, they might see their sale at 200, but I see it as a sale at 300 because I've made a time adjustment. Um, it is vital that we make these time adjustments because we need a significant sampling of sales to value the county. If the assignment is to assess one home, if I've got three sales, I'm probably happy. But if I want to assess the entire county, I need thousands of sales. And in order to, to do this, we have to time adjust. So I want to walk you through uh, what adjustments we propose, what is it we're doing, how do we get there. Um, the first method that I took was to look at a stratification. And stratification just means I'm grouping things that are alike together. So we took all of the qualified sales from the tax database up to August of 22, which was the most recent that we had. And we restricted this to residential improved properties and site-built homes only, no manufactured homes. Uh, any differences that we don't weed out could be a confounding variable. I might be thinking it's market and it could be that it was a double wide. So I need to control for that. Likewise, we control for quality, the raw quality grade C, which is our average or typical quality of construction. And then I stratify them by age. And so I set them into categories, 0 to 9 years old, 10 to 19 years old, 20 to 29 years old, and so on. And the reason that I'm doing that is depreciation. I need some control for depreciation. I can't have them, uh, I can't mix a, a new home and a 50-year-old home and pretend there's not a difference due to depreciation. So uh, we also work with a price per square foot. We don't want to use a total value, we want to use a per square foot value. In the little example here, I've got a sale at 240 and a sale at 480. Did the market double? Well, no. They're both at 160 a square foot. There's a size difference. And so working with the per square foot controls for that. Then, when we've done this, we take these sales per square foot and group them by month. All the ones in January, all the ones in February, and so on. And we find the median sale per square foot month by month. And we do this for each of the age groupings. This lets us build a table. So on the left-hand side, you can see the months, and at the top are the age groups, and in the cells are the median per square foot month by month. 
Now problematically, I can't compare these directly or that depreciation I'm trying to eliminate mixes right back in. But what I can do is I can look at the percentage change month to month. And when I do that, I can compare the percentage changes against each other without worrying about it. I can't do the square foot, but I can do the percentage change. This renders a single percentage per month. And if I set it to 100% at the beginning of the study and let that percentage change mount up from month to month, then I can get an overall factor. I know this is a lot of technical. This is easier to look at. So this is the graph that is produced. This is the percentage change per month. And the red trend line smooths that out because with this sort of data, the, the jaggedy shape is completely normal, but it's hard to read. <coughs> this method predicts 58% growth during the study period. So this is January of 2020, not, not back to 17 for the reval. We're not taking sales at all. The oldest sales we're using in our study are 2020 sales. That's 58% growth during not quite three years. I wanted a second approach because I, I don't trust just a single approach. I want another point of view on it. So I chose to work with a scatter plot and trend line approach. Very similar, I take the qualified sales from the database, I limit them to improved residential site built properties. But as a difference, um, I don't take sales of homes older than 10 years most of the time. I had to stretch it a few places to get to a significant sample size. But predominantly, these are 10 years and newer. With this approach, each sale is a data point. In the other approach, only the median was the data point. That makes this much more sensitive, and having the older homes in there, I, I can't cope with. I can't weed the depreciation out any other way. Again, we, we control for grade, but in this case, I take all grades. I take A grades, B grades, C grade, D grade, and look at each one separately. And again, it's a price per square foot. But again, because it's more sensitive, I have to put um, bounds on this. So I, f I figure out what the median square footage is, and I limit to 125% uh, of median and 80% of median uh, because it's more sensitive. If I don't do that, it will throw it off. And it produces a scatter plot. This is a scatter plot for C-grade homes. And again, there's a red trend line that goes through it, and it shows a growth over time. This model predicts 54% growth during the study period. And I feel pretty good about that. The two models coming in that close, there's a little bit of a difference there. But I don't like that they both had the same source data, even though they were processed differently. And of course, I was the person that processed both of them. So if I've got an error in the way that I'm <laughs> approaching it, I've put the error in both of them. So I would like to have a third check on this method. And I would like to have it independent data, independent work, and free. That's, I like That's free. I like free. Uh, and so what I've done is I've gone to Zillow, and now I always like to caution with Zillow. Um, I don't have high confidence in their individual property estimates. These are not appraisals. They don't go to the same depth of review. But their aggregate data, very, very good. They've been in the business for 17 years. They have over 8,000 employees. They've got top-tier data analysts, the excellent data software. And what they have done is they've broken it up into eight submarkets: Burlington, Graham, Mebbin, the Village of Alamance, Hall River, <coughs> Elon, Gibsonville, and Ossipee. And for each one, they've done a review. And as you can see here, this is Burlington. Uh, the numbers are a little bit lower than the Times News article, right? With a typical home value at 215, not three, well, 368. Uh, one year change of 26%, not 36% because they're looking at the entire market, not just what's been listed. So there's, there's a difference here. Uh, you can see that two-thirds of sales are over the list price, one-third are under the list price. You can see their curve for the market growth. So I took all eight submarkets and I weighted them by the number of parcels. You don't want a small submarket overriding a large submarket. So they're weighted. And that produced this curve and that produces a 58% growth. Matches the first approach very close to the second approach. Independent data, independent approach. All I did was put it in a spreadsheet so it would make a graph. So I feel 
pretty good that we're in the ballpark. We're, we're, we're close. So how do they compare? How do we reconcile this? This is the first model, um, the stratification model. Here's the second model, the trend line. Here's the third model, the Zillin model. You see, they're, they're pretty close. Between the three, two predict 58%, one predicts 54 I think the 54 is right. And the reason why is that Zillow includes all the older homes. And my first approach includes all the older homes with controls to manage that. But there's no way that my approach or Zillow's approach can eliminate the impact of depreciation and renovation. How do I know if a home resells that it was a market change and not a renovation? Sometimes I know, sometimes I don't. And, and Zillow doesn't know either. In the um, trend line, the lower approach, I just threw the old homes out. I didn't include them. So I've eliminated that problem. And that's why I think the 54% is in fact more accurate to market growth than the 58%. So that's what I follow. Um, I took the other two lines and just compressed them down to agree with the 54%. You see we're extremely close. And now the question is, which of the three lines do I follow? Which one's right? I have no idea. And no one else does either. Uh, this is one of those situations. I can tell you which one's the best supported. The one in the middle. At sometimes that's any of the three. They trade places being in the middle, but I'll tell you this. <laughs> yeah. If you're in the middle position, then you can call to the one above you and the one below you as your defense. Mm -hmm. And so what I've done is I've traced the middle position between the three models. And, uh oh, did the battery fail? Advance me. You broke the computer. I broke the, did I break the internet? Right before the big reveal. Oh, that's the combined model and that's what we've done. This gives month by month um, what we're doing to adjust for the impact of time. And I know this is kind of a, a long description, but I want you to understand how carefully we went through and how solidly I think that we, we've got the, the model worked out. It isn't perfect, no model is perfect, but it's reasonable. And when I have to adjust somebody's value and they say, but I paid X number of dollars, and I say plus two years and, and look at a different number, I can't pull numbers out of the air. I have to draw it from the data, and that's what we've done. The last piece of this, oh, it works again, um, is projecting forward to our effective date of January 1st. Um, and with that, looking at the, the various opinions out there, there's no real consensus. Generally, the, the thought is that there's not going to be a major decline by the end of the year. Any decline would probably be next year. I tend to agree with that. Um, and we mentioned earlier about some of the signs of an impending decline. Uh, but what seems to be um, happening is that demand is still outpacing supply. As long as demand is out in front, those prices are holding. Now, on September 22nd, the Fed increased the interest rate by three quarters of a percent. And there's another one coming. And that hits demand directly by reducing buying power. And so I have to take that into account. I'm also taking into account that we're going into the fall, and traditionally that's a cooling time in the real estate market. So what I've opted to do is let the, the model continue normally until September 22nd, use that as my mark. And from that point, it begins to fall by half the growth level falls by half each month. The value doesn't go to half, but the rate of growth halves each month. Flatlining in December, presumably after the second increase, uh, through the end of the year. But it likes to take down a Christmas tree, do they? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you do that by January 1st, the total increase is 55.75%. And you can see the line flattens out here at the end. So. What does this mean? Why, why am I taking your time to, to, to look at this? Um, the concern I have is that for an average citizen who's not following the market, who then gets a reassessment notice, this is problematic. And I think it's unavoidable. You know, I go back to the example we had earlier where we said, well, if you adjust for time, these are three sales at $300,000. This is great. I know what it's worth, $300,000. I've made a time adjustment. but. For the first one, they agree. That's exactly what they paid, right? But we're 50000 over the second one. We're 100000 over the third one. This is an appeal. Mm -hmm. 
And we're going to get a lot of these where they come in and they say, I've recently paid this amount. Why is the tax department so much higher? Do you really think you're going to have somebody at that 100000 mark and you're just going to call in an appeal? Huh? They're going to be hot. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. I've asked about the witness protection program. Does it extend <laughs> to tax assessors? <laughs> Put a bag over I'm tax man. I'm just saying, boy, I'd be down here with pitchforks and shovels. I, well, I mean, that's just, that's really mm -hmm. a, a slap in the face. It really, and I know that's just what it is, but mm -hmm. we've we got to figure out something. Well, and, and, and that's what I want to prepare you for is that, you know, you're going to have people that know you that will come up and say, I just paid this amount. The tax assessor has lost his mind, and I might have. But the, the important thing is to recognize what's going on and send them my way. Because, one, we might have made a mistake, and we'll sort that out. If we have, we want to correct it. And they may not understand the market. So we might be able to show them some more recent sales and say, but do you see these indicators? Do you see what we're looking at? And ultimately, let's say that, that we don't come to an agreement. There's nothing we think we need to fix, and they don't agree with our opinion of market. There's a board of equalization ready to hear their appeal. And we have a very good board of equalization. Um, but I don't want you to in any way be surprised and say, well, what's going on in tax? Well, this is what's going on. We have to treat similar homes in similar ways. And I've got all three of these sold. How can I make one 200000 and one 300000 I've got to pick a number. And I know which number is, is current market. It's got to be the three. And so we're going to go through that appeal. Um, briefly, the schedule of adopting a schedule. Today, uh, October 17th, this is the submission of the schedule. At the next meeting, we need to have a public hearing. So this gives the public a chance to weigh in, and this is very useful. We're going to put a copy of the schedule um, on display in the department. I'm actually going to send a copy to Maine Memorial Library. They the last time kept one for their reference. But most importantly, we're going to put a copy online so anyone can readily get to it and review it. At the last revaluation, we did have feedback, and we actually made changes per the citizen feedback. And we adopted a modified version. There was Rather than trying to change the, the book, we just had a, a rata sheet that says these changes are, are added, and we adopted that. Um, so this May is I important. Ask mm -hmm. that IT on our front page we starting can, soon. We can, we, can, we can have big letters. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Call Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Call Bill. <laughs> Customer service rep, Bill Ashley. Great. <laughs> <laughs> your thing, right? Personal I, phone number, I, not the county phone. phone. He never 1 had 800 one 800 babe. I'm going to have a call. Uh, I, I, will, I will do my best. <laughs> so uh, after the, the hearing, in the following meetings, there's three of these in a row, is the adoption. And hopefully, we'll have a, an adoption of the schedule then, probably amended. Maybe not, but based on last time's experience, um, I just don't believe in, in plugging my ears and not listening to citizens. If somebody has, has a comment, we listen to it. And if you get enough eyes on it, they see the things you didn't see. And so uh, with any changes, we'd have it adopted. After that is a four-week period where weekly advertisements are published uh, noting that it has been adopted this gives the public the opportunity to appeal if they don't like the schedule that the the board has then adopted they can appeal to the property tax commission in raleigh <coughs> if they don't do so by the last week of december that window closes and at that time the schedule of values is final and we move forward with it so that's that's the timeline of installing that schedule of values it would stand until the next revaluation. Mm -hmm. So. And you're confident you can get this done in five weeks? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And now this is just the adoption of the schedule. The schedule itself is done other than any changes that may come up. Uh, we have a little bit more uh, working time with getting values in. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not, this is not my, uh, this is not where I land, but I'm just curious. Um, mm -hmm. When is the last day where we can pull the ripcord and say we want to wait? December 31st. We, we have to, we can do all this work up until then, and mm -hmm. the December 31st is mm -hmm. the last get done right. day. It's got to be during this calendar year. If it, if it hits January 1st, it's too late. Uh, more realistically, the last meeting of the year. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble here, but this is so important. I would be interested in, like, is it possible to do a, a, a meeting the last week of December if we have to? I mean, uh, I'm available. I mean, this 54% number, I'm sure you've never mm -hmm. seen that something in your career. Well, and, and consider that has to do with our study period. So when I'm reviewing the market, I'm looking at sales as old as 2020 and making adjustments as needed. And, and do understand, we don't like using 2020 sales. Right. So if I've got plenty of, of 2022 sales, I'm not going to look any further. But if we have to, if, if I don't have enough sales data, we would rather get the, the necessary volume of sales with adjustments than have no sales at all. Um, the change from the last revaluation from January 1st of 2017 to now, preliminary 75, 80%. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of anything like that. See, I'm, I'm, that, 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 I think it just hit me that when we look at that big of this parity between the last one and where we're starting the numbers for this mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. even a comment to our public about a revenue neutral mm -hmm. adjustment to the tax rate, they're still going to experience an increase in their property tax, right? Mm -hmm. It, it, it depends on the it, it's well, I mean, proportion. The property has appreciated from 17 to 20, mm -hmm. and then you have accelerated appreciation from 20 to 22, mm -hmm. and then we do the calculation based on 20 to 22. Hmm. The 20 to the 20 last valuation was done in 17. Mm -hmm. The 20 to 22 is what we study when we set our values, but the the change in the tax rate would reflect the full span. So, however much the property values were to increase, revenue neutral would decrease by the same, it's, it's a balance. Okay. And so we wouldn't be in that situation where you do have some impact is vehicles, for example, are at 100%. Business personal is at 100%. Utilities are, are docked now, but otherwise would be at 100% compared to real property that is deeply discounted. So even if you, you balance out the bottom line, if you've been deeply discounted and you're kind of losing some of that discount, you're on a more level playing field with other types of property, there could be a mild shift from those other types back towards real property. Um, but what you would see then is a slight uh, increase to real property balanced by a slight decrease to all other types of property. So personal property would see their bills go down. Your car bill would go down. Your, uh, tax on business property would go down. Your tax on your trailer would go down. It would rebalance a little bit. But all of these changes are very mild. If it's revenue neutral, it would be very mild. So pay our car taxes late? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'd never advise that. <laughs> December the 19th would be our last meeting normally. Mm -hmm. So um, that would be the last shot to really. Because the next week is December 26th. Mm -hmm. So, I, so at this point, we need to set a, uh, we need to have a public hearing mm -hmm. in our next meeting, and then move to adopt whatever we do mm -hmm. the following meeting. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, Jeremy, if it would work. Uh, I'm just thinking off. I'm thinking out loud here. Um, just knowing that this number is going to be so large, and it's mm -hmm. really going to take people by. Oh yes. Yeah, that's what's worrying me. Should we? Should we? I know you're really good at speaking and really good at presenting these things. Uh, could, I'm just trying to. I'm just thinking out loud. Is there any way we could actually um, have this conversation again, oh. and and maybe <laughs> let everybody know? Hey, look, our tax guy is going to tell you. <laughs> is going to show you the difference. I mean, mm -hmm. a little bit like a meeting tonight. Mm -hmm. Like in a more public format, like an yeah. auditorium or something. Well, not so much that. We can do it here. It's We've just got a public hearing. Yeah. Our next meeting will be a public hearing. Mm -hmm. So we're actually doing that. Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking, though, like I said, this is going to extend way circumstances here. And it's like, you know, people aren't going to, uh, I don't think one meeting is going to get it done for these folks. And you, I've already had people come up to me. As of uh, I mean, mm -hmm. last week, right. six people that I did not know. Wow. You're going to keep an eye on us on, us, on this right reevaluation, right? right? And I was mm -hmm. like, yeah. If right. I can, right. but this I know the numbers that you have are mm -hmm. legit. They mm -hmm. are real. Right. I mean, the, the, I think the least you could probably go is forty-seven percent, and you'd be underwater. Right. The fifty-four number is a good number. Mm -hmm. I, I was, right. you know, the fifty-eight number, uh, sort of like 
Yeah, I didn't feel good about that number. And I knew that 58 number could not be good when the yeah. Fed starts raising rates three months ago. Yeah. And you see the demand, like you said, yeah. knocked out. You know? yeah. So you can sort of see it coming down. What concerns me more than anything is mm -hmm. what you said. Mm -hmm. Right now we're okay. Mm -hmm. December 31st, we might be okay. Right. Next December 31st, we could not be okay. Because we're still going to have an environment of increased interest mm -hmm. rates. We're going to... If we're going to have a recession, when the mm -hmm. two-year and the ten-year cross, you're going to have a recession. The Biden administration can change the definitions all they want, but every business school in this country mm -hmm. teaches people that, and have been for mm -hmm. decades. Right. That ain't going to change. Right. But we under, we should understand as officials that mm -hmm. these numbers are going to look a lot worse than they do right now. Mm -hmm. If we go into a recession, recessions mean what they say. <laughs> With the last revaluation. Uh, it was a little bit earlier on, so we were actually in free fall for probably the last six months before we locked in a value. But we were at the end of an eight-year cycle. We didn't have anywhere to go, versus this time we can push back one year if we wanted to. Um, what we did notice, uh, we had about three really low years where we were substantially above market. And every year we brought in appeals and then say, I just bought it. This is what I paid. And we'd say that's about right. We're you know we're ten percent over that. We're doing great. You know, um, that's problematic, and I would anticipate that happening. Right? We would have a decline following setting values, and we just need to be ready that for the next few years, if somebody says I paid X amount and you're above it, that was completely normal because we locked in at the market peak. Um, the severity becomes an issue. In 2009, it was very severe. Uh, I don't anticipate it being that level of severity, but I don't know. A lot of it hinges to me on the economy generally, because if we get into a situation that leads to a lot of defaults, we could find ourselves right back in a very similar scenario. Um, if we were to, to choose to wait, um, we could ride it down probably a little bit, but there's no guarantees. We've lost our options at that point. Once we, once we exercise the option, we, it's off the table. So what happens if next year it flatlines or increases, or and then we're out four hundred thousand dollars on utilities? There's just there's there's a lot there's a lot to consider there. Yeah, it's not cut and dry. Mm -mm. I agree with Mr. Lashley. Um, as our tax collector, collector of better term, right. uh, would you be willing to be? Yeah, you know, the only news. Well, I'm not going to say the only newspaper we have. But as a practical matter, Essentially. would you be willing to sit down with local media oh, absolutely. Um, and or radio mm -hmm. uh, and so forth and, and possibly go on line asking mm -hmm. questions or, you know, my next meeting uh, with WBAG mm -hmm. is the 14th of November. That's, we would have already had the public hearing by then. Mm -hmm. So we need to publicize this mm -hmm. well before mm -hmm. that happens. Well, and I was going to suggest that any kind of media outlet would be the way. Uh, what we did last time, we had um, a number of small meetings where we would uh, meet at a public library. We would advertise it, and you'd get a, a room full of people, but not a large room. Yeah. And the, the problem with that was the folks that attended those meetings, I knew half of them already, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> these, these are the very well-informed people that go to the meetings. They were going to know it anyway. It didn't push the message out to everyone else. But if it's in print, and if it's in the radio, audio, mm -hmm. and or video, exactly, uh, they're going to see it. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing that is probably worthwhile is when the notices do actually go out, is to be prepared at that time to do something more like a town hall. I might need security, um, but you get folks that are then engaged when when they've opened that notice and they're trying to figure out what are you doing. Then they'll show up, mm -hmm. and and so that might be the proper time to use that sort of a strategy, uh, whereas now would be more of a media-based strategy. Well, mm -hmm. I like both approaches, but mm -hmm. media oh. is beforehand, and yes. questions will be asked on the front mm -hmm. end. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Well, that's uh, all that I had for my presentation. Are there any questions? <coughs> Your time is up. No. <laughs> More questions? A great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any board members have questions?
Do I get any brownie points for bringing 382 pages of scheduled values? <laughs> I will take careful note of it. Could I get a job at the tax department? Any day. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you expect pay? I, I thought you were volunteering. <laughs> well, that's what I do now, so it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. We appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, county manager. Commissioners, in your packet are two reports your September monthly finance report and then the quarterly management report, which covered June to September. If you have any questions, happy to answer those. Um, I'd also be happy to work with Jeremy where we could put some more information out on a website beyond just a schedule of values. We could include his presentation. We could do a Q&A document where we're answering questions that we get about the process. It's really important that we get information out, so I'd be happy to work with him on that as well. And we thank you. Sure. Also, um, you and I have talked about cutting down the large report that you were doing traditionally. Yes. Uh, and I think that's a good move. Board, do you agree? Uh, There's a we're getting summary page. A few pages that's yeah. got a lot of very important information instead of 20, 30 pages, and we try to weed through it. Yeah. I just want to point out something to everyone watching and the board members to uh, take a look at the sales tax analysis from the county. Oh, board. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That ex just take a look at that. Well, I'm sorry. We've got to go back to Mr. Atkins because we've got to uh, determine that uh, we have two more dates. We have that is public hearing. Do we need, Ms. Stevens? Do we need a vote to have have that public hearing, or do we just announce it? Yeah, I think you need to to vote to have the hearing at the next date, and then from that point forward, you can set the following date. And thank you. So I'll move that we. Uh, had the public hearing on November 7th and that would be the uh, morning meeting and then we had the actual adoption and vote on November the 21st. Yes sir. Do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. What was it Mr. Lassie was stuff was Oh, I just wanted to just everyone just to be sure to take a look at uh, Heidi's um, uh, report and uh, number three in the sales tax analysis. Just take a look at it and you'll get an idea uh, of where we look compared to where we were last year. Mm -hmm. And you will see the differences. You'll see that you actually start to see the, uh, the uh, economy starting to shrink a little bit. We're not, we don't have the uh, 18, 19 percent increases in sales tax that we had just a year ago and now it's down into the sixes which is still really good compared to other counties. We're doing very well but just to show you that it's the thing starting to compress and you can start to see it and it, it took about 12 months for that to occur. Yeah well you know guys you don't have to let you eight percent less spending power yeah. Okay, we're moving on to commissioner's comments, Mr. Turner. Briefly, Mr. Chairman, uh, I appreciate Dr. Thorpe providing all the information that he did today, including the information about uh, the capacities at our local schools. Um, it's no surprise that the county is continuing to grow. Uh, there are counties in the state uh, that have not prepared for growth in their county so that they prepared enough school space for their schools and it affects everything in the county. Uh, I think we need a long-term plan. I think we need a strategy for three, five, ten years for what schools, um, what, what growth in schools we're going to have in the county. Uh, and I understand that Dr. Butler is preparing for his board a long-term facilities plan and is going to present that to them in, in short order. I applaud that and I think that we need to take that information into account uh, and start thinking long term about what we do with schools in the county. Mr. Carr. I agree with what you said, Mr. Turner. Um, looking at the census numbers and the projections for growth, uh, we we're looking at the possibility of an additional 5,000 students in Alamance County. And I know we don't know what the dispersion will be among homeschool, 
private school, charter school, and public school, but 5,000 more students is 5,000 more students. So at some point, we've got to figure out how to be prepared for that. Mr. Lashley. Well, oh, thank you. I just want to, um, I agree with uh, Commissioner Turner with what he just said, and I do applaud uh, Mr. Thorpe's presentation. It was really good and very informative, and I hope I hope a lot of folks could uh, see that they are actually doing a great job. Uh, but I will I will say, uh, Commissioner Turner, what we what I would like to do is um, uh, being an options guy. I want to have several different options. I want you know I think it's important that we look at long term what's going to ha going to happen with our schools, but we also should think outside the box. I want to use every viable option to educate our kids in the best possible way with also thinking about the people who have to pay for it. And I do agree with what you say. We do need to have a long range plan and I am confident that the superintendent is working on it and I'm confident that he will, you know, design a workable solution. But I also want just, I don't want to just be linear here. I want to think exponentially. I want to think about how many things can we do, not just building schools. Maybe we uh, look at um, uh, uh, these, uh, Schools like River Mill, you know these, the, these schools that yeah the, the charter schools. Just this this you don't just let's just think about everything how we can do it, do it all and just have a different a lot of different options because I think you know with many students as you say, could be in our in our county. There's gonna I don't think just one solution is gonna make it happen gonna make it done. So I, I agree with you, but I just want to make sure that we. Look at all our options and see what, what see what's best for our county and how best we can pay for it. Ms. Thompson, um, I printed an article for you guys. Sorry, no pictures. <laughs> My color <laughs> wasn't working, so it's got the words. Um, and I got one for Thomas too. You want it? Um, I had. Um, sometimes we have to have real difficult conversations, and um, and we just have to have them. And so I'm just going to read this so I won't get distracted. Um, I'm very blessed to be on the DSS board and at the last Department of Social Services board meeting, I asked Director of Child Protective Services, Angela Cole, some questions. Every month, I hear a human resources report about how many have been hired, how many have retired, and how many have resigned. And it can be discouraging. I asked Ms. Cole how many social workers does she need on her CPS team to effectively answer calls of child abuse, neglect, forensic out interviews out of crossroads, reports of abuse out of school systems, children sadly at a motel bus for drugs, etc. She told me and the board and the staff was there that her team needs 20 social workers. She said a dream situation for Child Protective Services would be 24. And I asked her how many she has, and she told me four. Three new people had been interviewed, but due to qualifications, only two had been hired and those two are in training. So four social workers and two new hires in training for the child abuse issues in all of Elements County. I also asked her when a social worker comes back from a call, a hard call, how are they supported by the staff? She told me that they are supported as much as possible, but with the time constraints due to dangerously low number of social workers to serve this county, they are right back out on the call. DSS has had quite the exodus of social workers and other areas of staff. Pay is one thing, but I dare say the overwhelming spread dangerously thin and short-staffed is the reason. This can, excuse me, create a toxic atmosphere, not due to people, but due to circumstances inflicted on people. This job is a calling, like all first responders and teachers as well. While it is a calling, it is also a career designed to make a living, to be able to pay your bills, have encouragement, and even enjoy making a huge difference and saving lives, just like our jobs. So I'm gonna to bring to the board things that are coming out of the boards and committees that I'm fortunate to sit on, because you need to know. I'm going to advocate for them and also have accountability from them. I printed this article from our very own former DSS director, Susan Osborne. Susan is now the Assistant Secretary for County Operations for North Carolina DHHS. And in her interview, she boldly puts the critical situation of departments of social services across North Carolina, how many are in crisis themselves due to shortages of staff and placement needs of children in crisis, and now some are being sued. 
In the article, Emotional and Behavioral Needs of North Carolina Children Can Go Unmet, when asked why Osborne thought the state might be sued, she said she was referring to issues with how officials are taking care of the behavioral needs of children. We are continuing to have children in emergency rooms and in DSS offices while we are awaiting appropriate placement, Osborne told CPP. Appropriate treatment placements for kids is probably the biggest focus of many. An investigation earlier this year by USA Today showed more than 1,000 North Carolina children were placed in psychiatric residential treatment facilities during fiscal year 2021. Remember that is post-COVID and kids were isolated and many were locked in with their abusers. It cost the state $423 per day to house a child there, the USA Today report said, and yet there is no evidence the treatment facilities are effective in helping children, researchers told the publication. Some children were shipped out of state as far as 1,000 miles away due to a lack of beds here in North Carolina. These are children, they're not cargo headed to Walmart. The bare minimum for success is the outcomes for kids removed from their families of origin should be better off than if we had left them in a situation where they were subjected to abuse and neglect. And I'm not sure we're there, said Susan Osborne. That is just a small quote from one of the most honest articles that I've read. Thank you, Susan Osborne. We as commissioners must hear the raw truth before we are in the same danger. This all goes back to a dysfunctional, unsafe, and dangerous home for a child. We are seeing the outcomes of this right now, and I'll give you an example, juvenile crime. So I'm asking for a total relook, possible restructure, and serious conversation about the salaries of our DSS. I'm going to, don't get ticked. I'm going to remind us how quickly we coughed up $10,000 for a trash detail for an already short staffed and overstretched sheriff's department. I supported that because Mr. Walker kept coming back and coming back. I didn't mind supporting him in a minute. I'm also going to remind us how we had an agency for folks with dementia and cognitive struggles that was a victim of COVID like so many other agencies. There was also Mr. Petrie, a very generous gentleman who donated a $2.8 million building completely free to Alamance County in honor of his system, who, sister who was a client at the same agency for 20 plus years. Three agencies are now housed in this donated building. Our board decided not to help them. We said no to nonprofits and I totally accepted that vote. However, Alamance County Department of Social Services is in crisis. And I have said that many times in our meetings and we have got to do something and fast. You know, people can be amazing at their job. A job with support and balance and accountability and encouragement will have longevity. However, without that, you have burnout, mental health struggles, and people walk right out the door. And whatever is left in the office takes on yet another load of clients. These are lives, the lives of innocent children, not just a file or a document. And we are looking at a diversion program which really touches this. And concerning diversion, I am 100% committed. I have went off site to Surrey County with Steve Carter and Krista Knight to learn about their outstanding proven drug opioid crisis response team program, we need. I've been to Orange County with a team to shadow a drug treatment recovery court, we need and Harnett County with a team for a veterans court, we need. If we are really committed to diversion, we must have the wraparound services that support us, including the programs for our children in crisis. I was in Wayne County last Friday visiting one of our clients at the Hope Center, it's a drug treatment facility, and it was my client's birthday. And while there, I met a woman from Surrey County who had been in treatment there for only two weeks. She told me she was not there out of the courts like my two clients. She brought herself there because she had tried to kill herself due to many years of drug addiction and abuse. She had a speeding ticket in Surrey County and a court date next month and was worried sick about it because she did not want to leave Hope Center due to the fear of using fentanyl. Krista Knight was with me and we called Sonia Cheek in Surrey County. Sonia is their peer support specialist just like Krista is ours. I met her when I went to talk to their team, and Steve, you met her also. Mm -hmm. Sonia told this young woman, no worries, she would handle it and make sure there was no call to fail, 
until she was done with her drug program at Hope Center. Now just think, forming that friendship with Surrey County instantly made a difference for this complete stranger, and that is what we are supposed to do as commissioners, as public servants, and as leaders make a difference for all of our citizens at their best times and at their worst times. We must not just build a building, we must build lives. And I'm gonna preach to myself, for all of us who are currently elected, for all of us who are running for re-election, for all of us who are running for an elected office for the very first time in this great county, this great state, and this great country. And the election is soon, preaching to myself, Please don't ever run to build a resume. Run to build a true public servant at whatever level and love your people. Be willing to risk it all to do the right thing. And never let your title, whatever it may be, be your significance. Because if so, we are not leaders. And this world is desperate for leaders, not more politicians. Amen. Okay, my comments short and sweet. Thursday, early voting, October 20th. And of course, we all know election day right around the corner, November 8th. I would encourage everybody to take part in vote. Mr. County Attorney. Not much for me, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to bring again to the board's attention the fact that I sent you an email earlier this week letting you know that the plaintiffs in the monument lawsuit have filed notice of appeal. That's all we really know at this point. Um, I'll give you more substantive information when we get it, but for right now, that's all we know. And um, then just a thank you for me um, to Reagan, who did a great job uh, a few weeks ago filling out for me, and thank you all for giving me some levity to have a week off so early in my tenure to go and get married. So thank you for me and my wife. Appreciate that. Congratulations. Thank you. Best wishes. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Joyce and I just celebrated 49 years. Hope you do the same. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. That's <laughs> and right you behind you. And, <laughs> and you guys still talk. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 We're out of here. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.local.gov.com tvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.